Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, we have apologies from our colleagues Donald Cameron and Stuart Stevenson. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. Um, I'll allow everyone some time to do that. <laughs> um, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items four and five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence on the Scottish Association for Marine Science Research Services Limited report review of the environmental impacts of salmon farming in Scotland. I'd like to welcome Professor Nick Owens, Dr Adam Hughes, Professor Paul Tett, Dr Lindsay Ver, and Professor Eric Verspoor. Um, welcome to all of you. Thank you for the work you've done on our behalf with this report. As you can imagine, we have a number of questions to get through, so we'll just kick on, if that's OK. Um, could you outline for us, firstly, and briefly, the expertise that has been deployed in producing this report, the um, qualifications of the various scientists who've contributed to it? Um, Indeed. Um, the typical way that we do this is by obviously assessing the, um, the work that's needed. And um, we all have very good uh, international and national networks in our specific field. And we chose who we consider to be the best experts available to be able to help, to help us. A number of the people, of course, are actually within our own institutes. And we um, sought the advice, particularly of colleagues in the University of Highlands and Islands and other MASTS institutes. Okay. And in terms of ensuring, what, this is a contentious subject, as we know. Yeah. Um, how did you go about in, um, ensuring and satisfying yourselves that the report is impartial insofar as it can be. Right. I mean, the, the, the principal way that we do that is by using the very well-established peer review system. Um, you know, that is, there hasn't been a better way yet found to ensure um, complete objectivity and as near as possible accuracy and um, at the limits of, of knowledge. And so that's um, the, um, in fact, all of the, all of the uh, written evidence that we pursued um, had, had been in some way or another peer reviewed. Okay, that's fine. Okay, let's move this on. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thank you, very much. Um, thank you for your work. Now, this review is uh, an update on the, the review in 2002, although with obviously a slightly different focus, and yet some of the scientific conclusions um, and some of the data problems particularly seem to be very similar. Have you, in, your, in the process of uh, writing this review, identified any significant changes in the environmental impact of salmon farming since the review in 2002? And if so, in which areas? And if not, in which areas actually did you recognise that very little had changed? I realise there's a lot in the review, um, so this is more just about headlines. Yeah, I'll ask uh, Professor Tep to uh, kick off that. Yes. Um, so, well, I'd like to distinguish between effects and Im impacts. Mm -hmm. So, um, the scientific process that Professor Owens has described um, is, is aimed to tell us where there's a causal link between salmon farming and a change in some aspect of the environment. Now, if the scientific evidence is there, then we can establish the link between some of the farming and an effect, I think we're confident. But effect is value neutral. Uh, impact demands, requires some evaluation of the effect. And that evaluation will depend on the criteria ap ap applied. And that, those criteria are both formal legal ones, their understandings of ecosystem health, um, but they also relate to societal concerns. Uh, and I was, engaged, I was involved in the 2002 review, and one of the most obvious things to me is the way in which societal concerns have altered <laughs> dur during that period. Mm -hmm. if, if I look back at the conclusions of the 2002 review, um, um, and, and then 
I agree with you, not a lot seems to have, cha <laughs> to have changed. So the first conclusion in 2002 was that waste and nutrients um, were unlikely to limit the expansion of the industry in, in the future. I think it's still the case today that although we can detect effects of organic waste from the farms and nutrients on the environment, um, they are not such as to be uh, of concern in relation to the ecosystem as a whole. You mean they're not such to be of concern scientifically in terms of the, the well, impact? As, as I drew the dis distinction, so yeah. science can tell you, say, that the effect of the organic waste from a fish farm um, is to change the population of animals and microorganisms in, say, 3% of the sea loch beneath the farm. Um, then there's the conclusion, is, is, is that something that society should be concerned about? And from an ecosystem point of view, and I'm an ecosystem ecologist, then the answer is, is no, because we know that if the sites are left to fallow, they will recover. Uh, uh, and that this is uh, only a small proportion of a sea lock. Um, now, in contrast to that, if the farm happens to be close to a protected habitat, uh, then and that 3% affected the protected habitat, then that would be a considerable concern. But that is where regulation comes in to um, ensure that sites of farms are not close to pr protected habitat. Hmm. And on that point, because in the report it's recognised that in 2003, 16 of 346 operating salmon farms were sited above marrow beds. Do we have a more up-to-date figure for that? Uh, not as far as I know. No. Because we are talking about pr uh, protected yes. uh, yeah. features, and, yeah. and that your report goes on to say that even after two years of following, that does not allow recovery for the beds. Yes. So, uh, remember that we... we were asked to review the scientific literature. Mm -hmm. okay. So there may well be evidence available which you could obtain from um, Scottish mm -hmm. National Heritage uh, 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 who, who monitor these situations. Um, uh, so all, all we can say is that no scientific papers have appeared ah. since the paper. So was you're not signed. aware of an update on that figure, uh, etc. Right, thank you. It was just to get correct. that one record. Yeah. Sorry, Keith. Yeah. And I think you're going to find this is a, you get this answer <laughs> in, in a number of. Uh, respects. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so if I return to 2002, <coughs> then the, the, the second issue um, was that the most likely uh, issues to limit production are medis medicine use, usage and sea lice transfer to wild populations of salmon, uh, which remains of concern to today. And Professor Verspore is more qualified than me to talk about that. Uh, the third issue was the rate of escapes of farm salmon is probably unsustainable and represents a major threat to wild pop populations. So again, I will pass over to Professor Verspohr if you want further information about that. Uh, and then the fourth issue is changes in fish meal supply may affect the sustainability of the industry. Um, so this is a concern two, two decades ago. Most of the raw material in fish feed came from wild fish. Uh, much of that has been substituted by vegetable protein today, but there's still a concern over the supply of fish oil and the omega-3 fat, 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 fatty acids. Mm. Explore those topics as we go through this yeah, session, yeah. that's mm. fine. Uh, so, in, in general then, we're looking at the same set of concerns now mm. as we were in 2002. I think it, 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 it's worth remembering that the Although the industry had gone through a rapid expansion in the late 1990s, so the early figure I've got is 83,000 tons in 1996, rising to a peak of uh, 170,000 tons in 2003. So the review came really based on scientific information from the earlier part of this period, so when, when um, production was lower. Since 2003, there's been no upward trend. There's been fluctuation uh, up and down. Uh, the production didn't, didn't reach that high figure of 2003 until 2015, when it got to 171,000 
t tons. Um, so the, the industry has continued um, in the region of 130, 140, 150, 160,000 tons during the period between 2002 and 2017. So in looking at the recent literature, we're looking at a period when the production of salmon in Scotland is roughly twice what it was when the literature was reviewed in the earlier period. But in very general terms, you know, with lots of caveats, then there's no, no published evidence that effects are more widespread in general now than they were detected in 2002. And Mark Truscoe wants to come in. I, I hear what you say about the early growth of the industry and the production levels that it's at now. I think you said about 176,000 tonnes. But the prediction for 2030 is 300,000 yes. tonnes. So how robust is the evidence, the peer-reviewed evidence of what's come before given that we're about to see an anticipated enormous expansion of salmon farming in Scotland. Yeah. Um, shall I pick that up? Yes, Straight please. Yeah. And other colleagues might want to come in. Well, of course, we have, we have to extrapolate here. Um, so, and the extrapolation would say that, that without additional mitigation, then we would expect more widespread effects. Okay. Um, so we have in the review suggested addi the additional mitigations that uh, would be necessary. And I think I, it's probably fair to say, you know, that many of them are in hand already or are being considered. In, in light of the expansion over the last 15 years, and as Mark Briscoll said, what's coming ahead? This might be an unfair question. Does it surprise you that the conclusions of the 2002 review are largely the same as this review? And does it surprise you that there has not been more published scientific evidence over the last uh, 15 years and presumably very little changes in the practices of salmon farming? So um, I'm not going to comment myself on the practices of salmon farming. I, I, I did notice that there was a pattern in the scientific evidence. Uh, so in the first decade, um, there have been a lot of papers published on the topic of harmful algal blooms. And uh, back in 2002, there was concern that the salmon farming industry was perturbing nutrient ratios in the sea and causing greater frequency of harmful algal blooms, which had harmful effects both on farmed salmon and on farmed shellf shellfish. Um, and I think that, that led to some international reviews. It led to commission work. It led to normal scientific work. Uh, and all those publications suggested that the cause of harmful algal blooms lies offshore, not, not in the salmon farming industry. So as a consequence of that, the... Um, Research died away, so to speak. John Scott. Would you care to comment on any possible effect of, of climate change and, and sea level temperature changes and how that might be affecting the yeah. effects it, 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 as well? It is the big question of our age, isn't it? It, yeah. it, 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 is, poss it is possible to see changes in ecosystems, certainly in the west of Scotland. Um, what is very hard is to understand what is causing those, those, those changes. Is it climate change? Um, is it fish farming itself? Is it other effects of human activity, you know, ranging from the disturbance of seabeds by fishing, by our removal of top predators from the food chain? I don't, we do not have enough information to be clear on, on, on this. So, in summary, there's a multiplicity of potential effects. Yes. That and I suppose what, what it's a dynamic situation that will inevitably constantly change, and fish farming is part of that. Yeah, I think I think we need to accept that natural ecosystems, even without human influence, fluctuate of, of their own accord. On, on top of that, we have recovery from the ice ages, and we also have human-induced cli climate change and a number of other hu human pressures. And these are changes that r take place on the scales of decades. Um, we need long time series of information to 
first to understand what's happening, and then secondly to stand a chance of being able to correlate what is observable with what has changed in the human pressures uh, on, 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 on the sea. Um, and I guess if I, if I can advocate something, it is for more attention to be paid to the, um, not so much the collection of long time series, because we're, do we're doing that, the routine monitoring of salmon farming uh, is providing a lot of data. Um, what, what doesn't seem possible at the moment is the synthesis, the analysis of those data um, in, in the sense of looking at what is changing in e ecosystems. It does appear that that is a gap since 2002 of I, w I, would, I, 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 w I would agree with, with that, yes. We're not doing as much of that sort of research as we had been up before 2000. Point, yes. yeah. Could, can I just follow up on that point? Um, and it's a layman's question, but could you quantify f for us the scale of the task that would be at hand if we were to address those points? I mean, how big a job, how long would it take to get a, a body of robust science to uh, inform our understanding and get on top of the situation? Right. So I, I guess that, that would depend on the particular aspect of the ecosystem and the particular area of co concern. So I, I, I can speak in relation to benthic impacts and pelagic impact, which are not of concern at the, at, at the moment. In terms of benthic impact, there's a very large amount of data collected from routine monitoring of locks with fish farms in. Um, so what's needed is a relatively small amount, yeah, a few person years, of continuing activity to put these data together with information on other causes of change. How long would it take, if, if we were to embark upon a robust uh, an extensive piece of work over the next five years, if we had you back in front of us in five years, how much more confidence would you have, um, if this was put together properly, in coming to conclusions about the impacts of salmon farming on the environment? Was it a five-year thing? Was it a ten-year thing? I know these, these are layman's questions, but we need to yes. get a handle on this. How big, how far away are we from really understanding the issues? Yeah, can, can I try and, and, and answer that? I, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating question, and I think we're struggling to answer it because uh, it's... It isn't particularly specific, but I, feel I, can, I can try and help by saying that I, I've actually just returned from a conference where we were talking about the observation of the global ocean. And in order to pick up some of the big ecosystem changes that are happening because of climate change and so on and so forth, you know, you're looking at decades and whole nations doing it. It would mean for Scotland um, doubling or trebling the effort that's currently going in um, just to get, just to get um, a under, better understanding of, if you like, this, the natural changes and the, the climate change-induced changes versus those that are much more local. So I, m m um, my sense would be that we're looking at probably a decade of, of really intensive work and we would be upping the, I think we would probably have to up, up our game by about an order of, order of magnitude. I mean, that certainly is the conclusion of this conference that I was at recently, um, we're looking at whole nations uh, investing very, very seriously. Um, and I think it's not to underestimate, quite, quite obviously we're talking about a very specific issue here with fish farming and so on, but actually the ocean has a considerable impact much, much wider on the whole of society actually, and particularly in Scotland. Okay, that's useful, thank you. Do you want to get back, John? In terms of the scale of the problem you define and orders of magnitude <laughs> being required to address a definitive view of the whole picture, is there any part of the picture that you would see that we in Scotland should be focusing on where you perceive a problem that is much need, mm -hmm. in much need of research and, and potentially addressing it? Um, yes, I think there are probably two key areas, and they're identified in the report. I mean, there's the whole question of the sea lice issue, and there is some um, work that we're beginning to embark on in SAMS that will, will, will help with that, but that but it needs re investment to do that. But there is some, um, I think, tractable 
uh, work that we could we could do there, but Professor Verspore could can comment better than me on that. Um, and I think probably this notion of the of, of the organic material I think is a, is, is an interesting one. Um, <coughs> Paul knows better than me about about that, but I think we could probably do more in in that area. Certainly, it seems to me the little I know, but that's an engineering solution that's required to catching the organic material and scooping it up or harvesting it and taking it away and doing something yeah, intelligent Adam, with it. Yeah, perhaps Adam can... There certainly that. are engineering solutions out there. The, the Norwegians are leading the, the, the technology in this area where the closed containment systems, where, where the sludge is taken off and removed. So, yes, there, there is an engineering solution, but alongside that goes an economic uh, our cost, obviously. So, that's a we'll, we'll explore that subject in, in greater detail as we move along. Uh, Finlay Carson. Um, we, we've mentioned marl beds a bit earlier. Can you tell me, is there any areas of environmental impact that the report doesn't address? So, uh, environmental impacts that you may not be aware of, but <coughs> environmental impacts that you are aware of that are not covered in the report? <coughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. shall, 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 shall I have a go at that? Um, well, we, we, we began with the process of trying to um, identify all possible environmental effects by drawing up a matrix of pressures, the, effect, the, the human activities involved in fish farming, and then uh, against that tabulating um, areas of ecosystem function from the marine strategy framework directive. Uh, so I would say we, we've picked up all the major issues with the exception of plastics, um, which is of current concern, but about which there is very little literature um, in relation to their effects in Scottish waters. Okay, and, and the next question, it, it's quite a, a comprehensive report uh, and it, it takes quite some time getting through. Can you tell me what the, the top three environmental impacts of salmon farming are in Scotland? And, and on the back of that, can you tell me what uh, is the likely outcome of an increase in salmon farming on those three uh, top concerns? So, so, well, shall I start <coughs> that? I, I think if I can refer back to my distinction between effects and Im impacts, uh, the effects are those that we've established through reviewing the scientific evidence, but the impacts, to some extent, depend on, on judgment. So you might get a different answer to this from different experts here. So I, I, I hope I'm not the only person to, to, to reply to this. Um, the, the top two... I, I, I'm, I'm a, a systems ecologist, so I'm interested in the health of ecosystems as a whole rather than individual populations. So the, the top two issues for me uh, are the, the global impact of getting the ingredients for fish feed. Uh, so clearly going to 300,000 tonnes of production uh, is going to increase the demand for ingredients. Um, and in this, Scotland will be in competition for Norway, which is talking about going from 1.5 million tonnes to 5 million tonnes uh, with Chile, with, with other world, world industries. So there, there, is, there are global issues here about the impact of this on um, land use, if most of the protein comes from terrestrial sources. Uh, there's impact on fish stocks if we still need to get fish oil from marine sources. Uh, so that would be my top issue. Uh, because of the scale. But, of course, Scotland only, is only playing a part in the global demand for this. Uh, so the, the, the second issue for me is the low-level and long-term effects of chemicals uh, on the environment. Uh, and this is a concern, I think, because we don't know enough about the long-term effects. Um, I mean, we have a good system of regulation which involves uh, environmental quality standards which set maximum tolerable levels but there has in recent years been some questioning of these standards in, in terms of their long-term pr protection uh, so i think this is an area we don't know enough about um, and it is it is one which could affect ecosystems as a whole um, through harming some of their essential com 
components, you know, from the small animals that live in the seabed and uh, by burrowing through the sediments, bring oxygen to it, uh, getting to the small animals that live in the water column and are an essential part of the, of, of the food web. Um, so th those, I've only given you two. <laughs> I would go on to say that I understand the concerns about the impacts of farming on wild salmon, both the impacts of sea lice and the uh, effects of escapes and genetic tra transfer. Um, but I don't see that as a threat to ecosystems as, as a whole. So my colleagues might differ. Anybody respect. else would want to add to those? Well, my, <clears throat> excuse me. My comment would be that uh, whether it's a concern does depend upon which sector you're in. Some people will see certain things as a concern and other people will see other things as a concern. As a scientist in, uh, and trying to answer these questions, my main concern is the lack of the information that one needs in order to answer these questions. Um, in my area, which is uh, Atlantic salmon uh, farm wild interactions primarily related to the genetics. Very little has progressed since 2002 to now in terms of the knowledge specifically of the level of interbreeding between farm salmon that have escaped and the wild salmon. Um, and you might ask why that is and uh, I think it is because the investment has not happened in gathering that information. Uh, we are very far behind Norway. You ask what levels of funding are required, I think you should go to Norway and see, and you'll see what's required. Um, from colleagues, I've had indications that their spend on sea lice research alone is a larger than the entire budget for all research here. In, in terms of farm wild interactions. Right. So that's, as a scientist, that is my concern. If you ask us to comment on these things, if you look on at the literature, the literature is incredibly sparse, uh, and particularly sparse in terms of Scotland and Ireland and out, anywhere outside of Norway. Can, can I ask, just on that very specific point, who funds the scientific research in Norway? Is it the government or is it the sector that's required to fund it? I, I'm not 100% sure of, if you said the total spend, who funds it, but uh, the industry does contribute and uh, the government does put a great deal of money in and uh, through various departments and uh, Yes, I mean, for one example, uh, a few years ago, sea lice work, there was a 23 million uh, budget for just sea lice research. Right, okay. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Thanks. So go back to the issue of environmental impacts that perhaps aren't covered by the report. There's been a very well publicized um, incidents where you've got the transport of dead salmon on the roads, there's been biosecurity issues with waste leaking out of trucks, potentially getting into water courses. So I wondered to what extent you saw that as a, as a problem. And also on animal welfare, if you see increasing expansion of the industry causing any issues in terms of uh, welfare of, of the fish. Talk about the welfare at least. Well, in terms of disposal, I, I think where there are large fish kills or fish deaths, then there, there needs to be a robust system in place. And that's really difficult because a lot of these locations are remote locations and these may be once in a five year, once in a 10 year event. So planning for such events is gonna be difficult and expensive and it needs to be proportionate to, uh, to the risk. Uh, and the, I know there is work going on at the moment looking at at the process of dealing with uh, large-scale fish kills, but I don't know where that process is in terms of evidence. Uh, sorry, what was the second? Welfare. Welfare. It, was about, it was about specific whether you see there are specific biosecurity issues with leaking fish waste, getting yeah. into water courses. And yeah, I think all salmon producers would take biosecurity very uh, uh, very seriously, and I, I think it would be something 
to talk to the salmon producers about specifically about the plans that they have in place. Uh, I, I can't comment on obviously individual cases which have happened up on Lewis, I believe, uh, recently. So, in terms of fish welfare, I think there's always going to be a proportion of society who are uncomfortable with farming of animals and farming of fish. Uh, I, I believe the welfare standards are very high at the moment, uh, but that's a, that's a personal opinion. Uh, and as the industry expands, there's no reason for those welfare standards to degrade. You know, the expansion I think is based probably on the current best practice. So, I guess I guess that's a societal issue to decide what they want to decide is acceptable in terms of their food production and animal welfare. Is it? Is it acceptable that we see 25% uh, mortality rate uh, within the livestock? So only 75% of farm salmon are actually making it to market. 25% are, are dying. Is that comparable with other production systems? So chickens or pigs? Uh, or I, I have no idea if that's comparable to other production systems. I, I don't know if those figures are... Uh, are across the board for industry and whether that's acceptable as I say that's the society or yourselves to decide okay. to other countries pardon how would that um, mortality rate compare to other countries uh, I, I, I don't have those figures I'm afraid so I, I, I think the, the Scottish industry compared to places like Chile where they've had large disease problems for the last three or four years uh, we are, we are probably above them in terms of the, the, or below them in terms of mortality rate, but I don't have the figures to if, hand. If you're able to source those in due course, that would be useful to have them, yep. particularly com comparable to, to the likes of Norway. That yep. would be an interesting comparison. Um, Kate Forbes. Uh, sort of supplementary to a point earlier around the Norwegian um, research, and several times, obviously, in this report, it was mentioned, for example, in relation to sea lice that, um, there was no data, specific data um, for Scotland, but that you had looked at um, studies elsewhere. What are the restrictions, what are the limits of using um, the Norwegian research in terms of applying it to, to Scotland, the Scottish environment? In respect of sea lice or uh, genetic interactions, uh, there generally is, is, I mean, it's accessible. It's relevant in it terms of it informs the potential for impacts and, and shows you the degree of impact often. Um, however, what it also shows is that the impact can be very local and it can be unpredictable and dependent upon very much local circumstances, the sea loch, uh, the, how do you say, the, the design, uh, but the, the, the layout of a sea loch, the direction of winds, those types of things. So therefore, it's very difficult to say whether you could predict what the situation is going to be in a given location. But, and this is where you very much have to have local information. Mm -hmm. And that's generally what is lacking, in the, at least in the public domain. So. This review is based upon what is in the literature, and what is accessible, uh, not just raw data, but what has been analyzed. There is very little out there. There, is, there have been studies, but they're not systematic, and they're not always up to date. Mm. Um, in most cases, they aren't. So transferring from Norway to here only gives you a general idea <coughs> of the, the potential for a problem. Uh, what it might be, what we need to do is collect information which shows what is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Given the lack of information and available science that we've been discussing today and has touched upon in your report, I'm struggling to see where the precautionary principle has been applied in allowing this sector to expand in the way it has. Is that harsh? I, I, I could comment. I, I, I don't, it has, I think there's been an attempt to find a, how do you say, a way to, to work together on this mm -hmm. historically. Um, Iceland has recently, and I'd recommend you, 
you contact your Icelandic colleagues and look at what they are currently doing. They are looking to expand the farming industry there and they have put in place a new regulatory framework which takes the kind of uh, approach that says, let's learn as we go. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, it's neutral in the sense that it says, if you don't find impacts, if you have evidence that there is no impact as opposed to there is no evidence for impacts, um, then the industry will be allowed to grow. If there is evidence of impacts, then the in industry may actually have to contract. So they have uh, uh, this a system which is flexible and adaptive, but it is very much contingent upon collecting the information. And there they are actually going to put the onus on the industry to contribute to the monitoring of uh, the environmental parameters, in this case, sea lice levels and levels of genetic intergression. Okay. John, John Scott. In terms of using Norway and <clears throat> Iceland research, how important is the difference in the sea temperatures from my very, very limited chemistry, warmer environments make things happen more quickly as a rule and and therefore might the problems be worse in our warmer waters relative to Norway and Iceland even though we're not measuring them whereas they might happen more slowly in these colder waters further north. Shall, shall, I, shall I try to answer that? Um, yeah, I mean what, what, what you say is exactly true. The rate of biological reactions doubles roughly with every 10 degree increase in water temperature. So, but the, the, the Norwegian coast is extremely long. Um, fish are farmed all the way up it. And in the southern part of Norway, water temperatures are not very dissimilar from, from those in the west of Scotland. Yes. Uh, by the time you get to the north of Norway, uh, then the water is uh, colder. Um, but maybe they, they, they benefit from the flows of warm water across the North Atlantic. So it's... Northern Norway is not as cold as you would, you would expect. Um, but there, there are differences. So, th for example, in terms of uh, lice control, I think the Norwegians seem to have a preference for using lump suckers, which are cold water fish, to eat the lice, as opposed to the wrasse, which are warmer water fish, uh, for which there's preference in, uh, in, 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 in Britain. Um, and, and would the water temperature affect the breeding of... of of sea lice, the fact that it's warmer, would they breed more quickly and more readily than they might in Iceland? Yes, we, yes. Uh, the, the life cycle would be yes. shortened. Yes, yes. And um, in, in, in terms of local environmental impact, then uh, the, with the, the, the typical fish farm, the typical salmon farm cycle is a, is a two-year cycle with the maximum stock held in the summer of the second year. Um, this is the time when the fish are growing fastest because the water is warmest. Yes. Um, um, so their metabolic activity is greatest. And this is the t it's in the summer when they would have the greatest local environmental Im impact through excretion. Yeah. So as water temperatures increase, then it's likely that metabolic activity will increase. Um, I'm talking about climate change here now. So we, we've seen roughly a degree temperature increase over the period that I've been working, which is going to have a small if effect uh, on metabolic rates. And the same thing will apply to the sediments. And it's coupled with the solubility of oxygen in seawater, which decreases as the water goes, gets warmer. So. Cold, cold, cold water is better for salmon because it's higher in oxygen than is warm water. And this is one of the factors which um, in, in, um, is in favour of growing sea bass and sea bream under Mediterranean conditions, under warm water conditions. Yeah. Okay, Finley Carson, just to wrap up this section. Kind of jumping back, but given the projected increases in uh, farm salmon and, and the answers you gave on, on what the, the the top two or the top three environment, environmental impacts. Could you tell me what role uh, could alternative approaches uh, or technologies have on those uh, two um, impacts? 
I, I guess you're referring to recirculation systems, which are these closed <coughs> containment systems, which take the production out of the environment, uh, and therefore you have much greater control over things like biosecurity, but also on where your effluents go and how you treat your effluents. Uh, the, 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 there's been a long interest in recirculation systems for a long time, and we are beginning to see first one or two commercial uh, salmon recirculation systems uh, here in Scotland and in Norway. So the technology is coming online. It, it's a question of economics about uh, the cost of production, the cost of uh, your, your capex. Your, it's much more capital intensive to <clears throat> build a onshore facility, although they're now moving to offshore closed containment systems in Norway. Uh, versus the running cost and the environmental benefit. So it's a technology that has been coming for the last 10, 15 years, and it's still just on that cusp. Uh, it, it will have environmental benefits, it, but no food production system is without environmental impacts, so there, there are other environmental impacts associated with it. It's just a question of economics of whether uh, it is cost-effective to produce a salmon in uh, closed containment systems. And there's also a societal perception over that. There's been work done that has asked consumers whether they think uh, fish farmed in a closed containment system is more environmentally friendly than an open water system. And the consumers believe the open, open water system because it's more natural and therefore there's greater consumer acceptance for cage farming than there is for recirculation systems. Just on that, what, what's actually driving the change? Is it economics in terms of increased production because of fewer losses, or is it driven by regulations with regards to environmental protection rules? What, what's the driving force and the change to, to more containment? My, my feeling and a personal opinion here is that the main driver is through biosecurity to allow better control of that production cycle with less losses and a, a better prediction of what the end product will be, if you so I mean, it's much easier to, to control the environment and therefore you have a better idea of the product you will get at the end of your production cycle. So. Okay. Just very briefly. Uh, just very briefly, um, in terms of the capex and the economic costs, uh, how does um, government support in Scotland or lack of incentives compare with, say, Norway? I'm afraid I don't have the answer for that. So. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Let's move on to look at the sea ice issue in more detail. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. And I, I start this having been involved with, um, as a complete layperson, with the um, aquaculture bill with some trepidation. So I think rather than dip into the areas that, that um, as a committee, we may want to make recommendations about, um, initially I want to... Um, to uh, start with the science, which is what you're here for, um, and, and where the science has got to, and perhaps what would be useful for the science in the future to further inform us. Um, but I do, uh, I'm tempted to make one uh, comment, which is actually not a comment, because it's a quote from your report, um, which actually says on, um, at point 2.1 on page 10, that sea lice are, and ectop ectoparasite, which of course your cells will know, but for the record, I'll just read that out, and a key impediment to the expansion of the Scottish salmon farming industry in the marine environment. And I, I perhaps should have held back on even that, but uh, there is a concern, um, not only in the public, but with respect, I would say, in the scientific um, uh, communities, um, not just in Scotland, but globally, about this issue. So. Let's start with the science, please. <laughs> yes. Um, I, your specific question about the science, what aspect well, of it? Well, you, you could cover, each of you, whatever it's appropriate to cover. I mean, for instance, um, the effect on wild fish, the, um, your, any uh, views um, highlighted in the literature um, about the um, welfare effects on the farmed salmon themselves or the trigger levels that might be appropriate for um, action in view of the science in terms of the numbers of sea lice on smolts, post-smolts and adults. 
or possibly on the transparency of the um, possibilities of analysis of the science in relation to whether um, it's appropriate that um, that should be more publicly available, um, which was my amendment on a farm-by-farm -farm basis, which was rejected at the time in 2013. So, or any other aspects of the science that are appropriate to comment on. It's really to open it out because myself and other members have questions on this important issue. Okay, I think um, perhaps uh, Professor Busbore will answer the questions um, about the, sort of the impact of the, of the sea lice and in the, the levels and, and the, the sorts of questions you're asking there. I'd like to, f to end and follow up actually with some, um, uh, some information, some thoughts around about um, ecological modelling yes. um, and how we might uh, make a step change in improvement. But I'll leave that until the second and point. The figures around the volume of farmed salmon that's being lost specifically to sea lice annually I don't know the answer to that, but Eric, you might. <clears throat> yes, uh, there, I, I believe there are estimates of, of the volume. However, um, as this review focused on the impact of the sea lice from farms mm -hmm. on the wild populations, that's the literature that we reviewed. So exactly what is going on on the fish farms themselves hasn't been covered. So I think you'll have to bear with us if we don't have those particular figures. What we do know about the science is that an excessive sea lice burden on wild salmon can have a negative impact on their survival. What we do know is that there is an association. Because you said it can, but um, in terms of the research literature that you've highlighted um, in, the, in your report, uh, it ha does actually say that um, more than 11 sea lice on a smolt or post smolt would lead to mortality. So there are actual factual, well, uh, there is scientific evidence that shows specific um, yes. points as well. A absolutely. But, sorry, perhaps you were coming to that. Uh, well, the, I'm, I'm somewhat hesitant to say it's, you know, um, two sea lice per 10.3 grams of, okay. of fish. It's going to depend very much on circumstances yeah. and very. Uh, with the individual fish and other factors that might be affecting it. Mm -hmm. um, the, si uh, the size of the fish will, will be one factor, but there will be others. Okay. I think the state of the science is that you could probably say that if you increase the sea lice burden on a wild fish for a, a significant amount of time, you will increase the likelihood of it having a negative impact either on its growth or on its survival. Sea lice do not benefit salmon. So the extent to, to which they actually are um, attached to salmon is going to depend upon the circum local circumstances. And that's going to depend upon uh, the time of the year, the, the environmental conditions, and, and a lot of factors. And the so you can say there is a risk, there is a potential of a problem. Um, whether it is a concern in a given location is another question. And certainly in Scotland, there isn't in public uh, domain, but it's a, a location that I'm familiar with. They have had historical highs in their salmon, and yet those salmon have to go past a very large uh, uh, salmon farming operation. So is that, are the sea lice having a negative impact if the salmon are at historical highs? However, there's a large number of confounding factors. The river is stocked. Is the stocking accounting for the historical highs? Is it because the marine conditions where that, those particular salmon go happen to have been particularly good. Not all salmon go to the same place in the ocean. Not all have the same journey. So it's very difficult to extrapolate from some controlled study in one location under a certain set of environmental conditions, including temperature, feeding regimes, and that as to so many sea lice per gram of fish being critical. So you can measure that anywhere and that's going to be the trigger as to whether and how big your problem is. And could I just ask if the, the well, I, I would 
think that the uh, there's also the issue of the amount of sea lice that there are actually on the salmon in the farm, which the wild salmon are passing. Ab absolutely, which and is, you did is significant in terms of yes, and you did yeah. ask the question uh, about the accessibility to data. If you're going to do good science on these questions, you need access to data, and that data as far as I know, at least to some degree, is being collected, but it is not generally accessible. It is not universally in the public domain for scientists to actually take it and analyze it and say what it tells us. Is it sufficient data to answer the questions? At, or if it's not sufficient, how should the data collection be altered to improve it so that we can actually say more about what the, the impact might be or how the sea lice might be controlled, these types of issues. So we've been asked here to review the literature, though that information is not in the literature, therefore we cannot comment on it. But could you comment on how important um, in your view or any of the other panel members before we come to Professor Owens, uh, how important the issue of um, the transparency uh, and, and the real-time uh, public uh, uh, openness about data on a farm-by-farm -farm basis could help the development of science in order to know how we... It would help the advancement of science. However, I do equally understand that there is a misuse of this information on both sides of the fence in the debate. and. Uh, what is, there's a problem, it, science takes a long time to actually crunch the numbers and assess the implications of it. And often what, when some of this data goes public, there are knee-jerk reactions to, to what these things actually mean or don't mean. And this is I th an obstacle, I think, um, to it. So yes, I, transparency in principle, if you want the best science to inform the debate, you need transparency of the available information. But surely how, how that information is used by anybody beyond the scientists would be just the same with an issue if there was a, a, an issue of a leakage from a burn or into a burn of, of a discharge, which is public information that SEPA would do on land. So I, can you explain to me what the difference would be? Surely it's something I, that... It, it, I'm, I'm not defending... I'm saying that those, those... The reasons of the misuse of the data by certain mm. sectors... But is that a reason I'm saying no, not, not to have my, the science not, public? No, but it, um, I'm, I'm just saying okay, this is sorry, why it's I'm not happening. What you're saying. It, um, I'm saying that I, it should be happening because I think Thank ultimately you. in the long term, if you want science to inform the debate, right. you need everything yeah. to be accessible for analysis. So could we go, thank you very much, that's very helpful. Could we go to um, Professor Owens? Yes, certainly, and, and it's actually a very pertinent point um, to come in here, because one of the things that we are in the business of doing um, is actually modelling um, the uh, distributions of sea lice. So we um, are combining a biological model with an ecosystem. Is that the same as bio? Physical modeling, or yes, is that basically, different? yes, okay. and <laughs> and one of the limitations that we've got in terms of almost getting a predictive model as to where um, sea lice will be transported to from fish farms and so on actually is the availability of real live, real time data. Um, if we had farm by farm data on the distribution and numbers of sea lice in those cages, then we would have a, a considerable improvement in our predictive capabilities of the, um, certainly the, dis the, then the distribution of the sea lice. It's then a, you then move into a biological question as to what might happen um, to those sea lice and the impact that they might have on the salmon. Um, but to take the example that we've just heard of, one of the possible explanations for uh, a, a, apparently um, high levels of wild salmon in a, in a caged area is actually the very fine scale variations that you would get um, in the distribution of the sea lice coming from the cages versus where the wild salmon are traveling. And we don't have that because we don't have the real time data. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Alex Rowley, she was to come in just now. Yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking that, that the um, 
the science of the impact of sea lice on salmon is perhaps something you don't hear being discussed in the pub on a Friday night. But when the one show ran its two evenings, a programme on salmon fishing in Scotland, I think people were horrified to see the amount of dead salmon being put into lorries and being shipped halfway across Scotland. And I think there is genuinely, therefore, a public need to know in terms of these issues. This report doesn't, as you say, because, well, I'm going to come on to that, doesn't highlight really the, the disease within the, the salmon farms. Uh, it really doesn't go into the detail of why so many fish are being slaughtered. Uh, I do think to myself, the local farmer that I know weighs dairy herd, if 25% of his cattle were being slaughtered every year because of disease, there would be a serious problem. There'd be a serious problem right across the industry. As Mark Ruskell said, these, these dead fish are, being, are, are being, being transported around Scotland. So is there a lack of data? Regardless of this question of whether whether uh, data can be used or misused, depending on who's got it. Is there a lack of data exists farm by farm of the amount of disease that's in the fish stock, given that 20, 25% of it has been slaughtered? If the, the production of fish has, 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 has grown twice, the, the level of production in, in, since 2002, what's happened with the amount of fish that are being being, that are dying as a result or being slaughtered as a result, as a result of disease? And do we just keep compensating for that? So, so if we're going to double the production over the next 10, 15 years, is that to compensate? And should we not be trying to do something to tackle why this disease is there? Yes, I, I think this is out with the remit that we have been given, and it's uh, the people who will be able to answer the question that you are posing, who have whatever information is available on that issue, will be Marine Scotland Science and the Fish Health Inspectorate and people associated with them. And uh, therefore, I would direct you, those questions to them. Um, we, we have dealt specifically with the impacts on the wild stocks, not on, uh, on, uh, on, on that side of it. Uh, I, we don't have access to their databases, so I couldn't answer what information they do have and they don't have. But if you have to look at the disease interaction between farm salmon and the whale population, should you not have access to that data? If, if the level of disease is continuing to increase and being compensated for by farming more, then is that not putting more risk at, 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 to, to wild salmon and our rivers up and down Scotland? Yes, it, it potentially is, and, but again, this is the area where Marine Scotland Science the, uh, and the Fish Health Inspectorates and their team are, uh, that's their area of, of work. There is some published information on it, but uh, uh, scientific studies which are referred to in there, but the, kind, the level of information uh, and that you're asking for is not out in the public domain, and you would have to check with them. Next week, when they're in front of us. Do you have any further questions, Mr Rowley? No? OK. Um, John Scott, briefly. Thank you. Just going back to um, sea lice burdens, and just and the lack of published information, so we in the realms of conjecture, which I would invite you to speculate on, but from what you've said, would I be right in deducing that there are a number of key variables really in um, the likely level of, of sea lice burden in terms of the genetics of the salmon themselves which vary in their ability to either fend off or absorb sea lice. The feeding regimes that, that what the salmon themselves are fed on may attract the sea lice to them. The temperatures um, the water conditions in, in which they find themselves, uh, are these, I mean, I've been right in deducing that, that these are the, uh, variables in, if it was, uh, almost to an extent that if it was a differential equation, there's so many variables that make it impossible to solve, but are these the variables nonetheless that you have to contend with in terms of arriving at a conclusion? 
Yes, I think, I, I, in, and again, the Norwegian research program has been the one which perhaps gives the best understanding of, of the effect of a lot of these variables that you mentioned on it. But what they've also done is they've said, well, um, is there an association across Norway with the health of salmon populations and the levels of sea lice? And in general, they find that there is an association that the higher the sea lice levels in an area, the larger the effect on the wild populations where you see. So, but it's correlative. However, they do find exceptions, <laughs> okay. of course, just, just because of local circumstances as, as, as we've discussed probably underlie this. Okay. Um, one final question on this particular section. The report says that sea lice populations appear to be developing widespread and serious resistance to many existing treatment. Is there any Scottish specific evidence of that? Are we talking global evidence? This is global, evi it's global, global evidence. It's global evidence. Yeah. So we do, that's another gap in terms of our understanding on a Scottish level. Okay, thank you. In your report. Yes, there is. It actually there. says that, that they appear neither to, the methods appear neither to be succeeding in controlling sea lice nor capable of addressing the environmental effects of sea lice. And I quote from from um, two one four in the report. Yeah, sorry, I was, so I was addressing the question about whether the evidence for developing resistance of sea lice to, to okay. chemicals is gained from Scottish right. work. Thank you. Let's look at uh, to the discharge of waste nutrients, John Scott. Um, thank you very much. Um, you provide information what the literature says about EQS um, for imamectin benzoate. Um, what does your review suggest in relation to possible changes to EQS for EMB in Scotland? Yeah. Isn't it? Um, yes. So, shall I? I'll start by explaining a little bit about um, imamectin and. How, how, how it's used. So this is an in-feed treatment. It's, su it's supplied in the salmon food. So um, it's carried in the blood of salmon and uh, in that way it gets to the sea lice and uh, certainly damages sea lice gro gro growth. So it's a, it's a systemic, think of it as a systemic insect insecticide. Um, it reaches the sediment in the faeces of the, the salmon um, and then can penetrate into the food chain um, if animals on the seabed then uh, eat salmon faeces or eat the bacteria which have eaten salmon faeces. So an environmental quality standard is something that's set by the regulators to ensure a minimum safe level of the particular chemical, hemomectin, um, in several different respects. So what one would be in respect of anything that was going to be eaten <laughs> by humans. Uh, so for, for, for example, there would be a level, an EQS set for mussels intended for human consumption in order to avoid emomectin getting into the human diet. Um, then there are lower level, there are levels set for in concentration in the material of the sediment in order to protect animals that live in the sediment. Um, the EQS in that case is based on laboratory experiments <coughs> with uh, a number of test animals, you know, the, um, the marine equivalent of white mice. Uh, so the test animals are things that can be grown well under laboratory conditions and therefore are pretty robust. Uh, so the experiments basically determine the minimum dose of the chemical necessary to have a harmful effect on the test animal, so, and then work out what concentration would have no effect on the mm -hmm. test animal. So this gives us the uh, NAOEC, the no effect concentration. <coughs> then it's necessary to introduce a precautionary factor to, because the test animals are very robust. So the precautionary factor might be 10, 100, or 1,000. Uh, this, this is aimed to introduce sufficient precaution so that we can rely on EQS providing adequate protection of, say, the animal community that lives on the seabed. Now, there are two areas of uh, 
where this is now seen as an issue. The, the, the first is, are we introducing enough precaution <laughs> in, into this? Because um, do we know how sensitive certain animals are? Um, and the second is, okay, we're now we're in, in developing these EQSs, we're talking about the direct effects on particular animals. Are there more general, diffuse, long-term effects on ecosystems, for example, on the behaviour and reproductive capacity of animals that won't show up as mortality, mm. but will, will, will in interfere? That. And it's in that latter level that we, it's proven very difficult to get evidence. Um, and amongst the reasons for that uh, include the necessity of relating sediment concentration of emomectin to the state of the animal community mm. in the seabed. So there are two particular difficulties there. One is that most, most of the monitoring surveys of emomectin are not sensitive enough to measure the levels that, that may be causing harm. Um, so recent improvements in techniques have begun to remedy that. Uh, but the second issue is that the samples for chemical pollutants in the sediment are taken in different places and different times from samples for the biological contents of the sediment. So it's very difficult to do a reliable statistical analysis to look at the relationship between the emomectin content of the sediment and the biological content. Now, one of my colleagues has attempted such an analysis, and this is published in a, in a report by the Scottish Agricultural Research Forum. And so that suggests that there are locks where levels of emomectin are being detected some way away from the fish farms and that this is correlated with changes in the community of animals in the sea seabed. Uh, but the, from a scientific point of view, you have to say that the confidence we have in those conclusions um, is only moderately strong. It, we, the statistical analysis is the best that can be done, um, but it's limited by the data of available. So this is one of the research areas, I think, where there is a need to do a specific, probably long-term investigation of a few sea locks where there will be research studies of the levels of these chemicals in the sediment and long-term studies of changes in the communities of animals um, and including the effects of other potential changes so the other, the other effects which can be confounded with the effects of the medicines are the organic input from the farm. Mm -hmm. so for example, a big farm will have a lot of organic input. Mm -hmm. It will also use a lot of medicines, and it's difficult to distinguish the two. And the two may interact one on the other. Yes. Um, so I suppose it, the very summary uh, of that is this is an active, this is an area where... Well, this is an area where we deserve further research. Yes. Because from what I've read in your report, it appears that the breakdown of the evidence, of, it's linear almost, the distribution of ivermectin in terms of distance um, yeah. from the cage. Well, I'm, I suppose, probably, and therefore that's obvious, but what I'm more concerned about is the, the effect of, of, on other species of the, the breakdown of the ivermectins um, in the sea and, and the impact that may have on other sea life. Um, and you're really saying that it needs more research to even begin to measure that. Is the, is the breakdown process of, of the ivermectin or whatever it's properly e called? E emomectin. Emomectin. Yes. Um, declared interest as a land-based farmer. Um, is it is the breakdown quite clear and quite well defined and does it break down into um, components that are not dangerous <clears throat> well, it, in, in, in the degrading process? Yes, so I mean, it does eventually break down into non-dangerous com components but I, as far as I, know, I don't know of research onto the breakdown products, there is research into the breakdown time um, which is around about half a year uh, typically. Um, but it does seem to vary between sediment type and sediment con condition. Yeah. So sediment type can have an effect it, 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 on it, it, the breakdown process, and the sediment type is a function of what the fish are fed on in the first place. Well, it, 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 or indeed it, what the seabed is composed yes, of also. It, it, exactly, and I think one, one of the conclusions I've come to from looking at all the papers that have been published 
uh, is that there is no standard sea lock. Uh, there are a wide variety of physical types with a wide variety of sediment types. And uh, I think there, there is, it's clearly desirable to, for each farm, each farmer, to understand the local con conditions, which may favour rapid breakdown of the chemicals in some cases or may retain them in other cases. And so there is no, there's little published information to tell us what the spread but of Nonetheless, it would be an area hugely worthy of further investigation to provide guidelines in due course as to suitable locations for future yeah. fish farming relative to the type of seabed and, and not necessarily just because of the species but because of what the seabed is composed of yeah, as so well in terms of sludges. Yes, yeah, so I, 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 I agree strongly. And we, I mean, we have a precedent for this in the locational guidelines um, that Marine, Marine Scotland um, started in 2002 and updates reg regularly. Uh, and the, the, the locational guidelines looks at effects on the seabed and the water, the, the water column. Uh, and it could be expanded to take into account the sorts of variations in sediment quality that we're talking about. Thank you. Um, so, is there any data and analysis gaps? Maybe I've already asked you this question related to the discharge of medicines and chemicals into the environment. If so, how might these gaps be filled and what would the benefit be of filling these gaps? Although I hadn't read that question up till now, it appears you've already answered it from my previous well, question. So, so I've answered it, answered it in relation to MMectin yes. and the, the sea life treatment uh, medicines. So that there are two other categories of, of chemicals. Thank you. So one, one is antibiotics. Yes, indeed. Uh, and so the, the evidence we have um, is that they are comparatively little used in Scotland I'm compared pleased to, to hear it. used in, in Chile. Um, so va vaccination of fish against disease seems to uh, be part of the cause of, of this. Um, the third category of chemicals are those used in anti-fouling, uh, the, the paints that are applied to farm structures and the steeps that are used with nets to prevent seaweeds uh, yes. and barnacles gro growing on the nets. Uh, and of course, they're not, all, they're not only used on fish farms, they're used on, um, say, on sailing boats, you know, on any, on any more structure in the water. So that, I mean, as, you, as you may be aware, looking back into the, over the past 20 or 30 years, there's been a big change in the nature of anti-fouling compounds. It was discovered in the late 1980s that tributyl tin had very harmful effects on mollusks. It, basically, it caused them to change sex. Um, right. Um, and this, this had rather unfor unfortunate effects on shellfish farms. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, from this and from other evidence, there's been a major change in the kind of anti-fouling chemicals used, and they're now based on copper and zinc with some organic ingredients. Um, so these, these are less harmful as far as is known, but there are some... Um, indications that, again, we, we don't know the adequate environmental quality standards for some of these chemicals in relation to ecosystem function. Now, this has not been raised as an area of concern so, so far, but I think it's something that would need to be kept under review if the industry expands, and particularly if, if it expands in large floating offshore structures. Uh, which we're going to need anti-fouling treatment. Of, of those three issues then, which would you say was the key one where government money to be directed towards research? Oh, I, th I think it's, it, at the moment it's the direct impact of anti-lice chemicals. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> can, I, can I ask, we're told in the report that the depth mod model is now thought only to be accurate to 63 to 85%, which is somewhat at odds with an original accuracy estimate of 13 to 20%. This is a layman's question. And from a scientific perspective, with how much concern should we view that differential? Um, the fact that we've that it's been considerably improved, mm -hmm. um, I think I think um, we should be um, pleased that it's that it's improved, and uh, we're still working on them on the models to um, uh, to make them even more accurate and more useful. 
Okay, that was my clumsy attempt to get that on the record because I read that part of the report three times and it could right. have been read two different ways. <laughs> so it's, it's an improvement. It's an improvement, right. yes, indeed. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I asked that question <laughs> on behalf of the committee. Uh, <laughs> Finlay Carson. Just very briefly, and it's, uh, the question comes from my experience of using ivermectin and cattle and the, and this, the resulting very slow breakdown of uh, animal dung. Is there any consideration uh, when they're using... Um, uh, well, not your, the, the, the fish equivalent, I presume, of how, the, if it was to be withdrawn, what the impact would be in the breakdown of the, the sediment? And there's any, is there any work done on, on how quickly the sediment breaks down or otherwise uh, with the use of, of that pesticide? And, and, or, or should there be? Shall, shall I yeah, try, try, try to answer that? So, I mean, the, in, in very general terms, the rate at which fish faeces break down and any organic input breaks down um, d depends on bacterial activity and that in turn depends on the rate at which seawater containing oxygen can get into the sediments. Uh, and you might say that one of the key roles for the larger animals that live in the seabed, the, wor the worms and the prawns and so forth, is to burrow into the sediment to rework it and to let a flow of water in. So if these animals are harmed if their activity slows down then the rate of reaeration of the sediment will slow down and so the rate at which the uh, waste material breaks down will slow uh, and that means that the following period <laughs> need, would, would need to be longer. Yeah. So we should bear in mind that if, if these chemicals would, are still being used the sediment's likely to break down far quicker and there may be environmental impact of that? I, I, I don't think we can say that we, we, we know that. Uh, it is possible to turn it around to say that if these chemicals are affecting the, the I think what I want to call them, the macrobenthic organisms, the reworkers, I think it says in the, the worms and the creatures like that, if they are being affected widely over the base of a lock, then it means that the general rate of breakdown of organic material will slow, slow down. Um, let's now cover the issue of the discharge of waste nutrients and their interaction in the wider marine environment. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, I, I just wanted to linger a little bit longer on the chemicals, though, and just ask about cocktail effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, is this something that you believe there's an evidence uh, research gap? Is it, are there proposals coming through SAF or, or elsewhere to study what the interactions might be of some of these chemicals? Um, I think the simple answer is it is a research gap. I don't know what the situation is with new proposals for research on this. Okay. So turning to, to nutrients then, um, I mean, my understanding is that SEPA uh, are feeding into a, effectively a sector review which will look at a revised environmental quality standard for emamectin, but also look on the nutrient side uh, introducing a, a new uh, depositional zone regulation, or, or DZR, which on the face of it could allow the industry to expand but could also increase um, <coughs> environmental compliance. I just wondered what, what your thoughts were, particularly on SEPA's DZR proposal. And it's something that we've known about for some time. It hasn't come up to the committee yet. And I'm just wondering how you think that reflects on, on the research base that you've been looking at. <clears throat> yes. Uh, so the changeover to DZR, I think, in the so much as it uh, has allowed a review of the, the current uh, uh, way that uh, the fish biomass is consented for a site, uh, is to be welcomed. I think uh, the the prescribed limit of two and a half hour, sorry, two thousand five hundred tons of salmon per site as a maximum had no real basis in evidence. It was a, a arbitrary figure. Uh, I think the DZR will now allow a more uh, adaptive and responsive uh, management of biomass, which will which either be allowed to increase or decrease as depending on the, the impacts on the benthos. But what we don't have as scientists is any clear understanding of the mechanisms behind DZR in terms of the, the detail. It, it's gone out to consultation uh, and it's widely been consulted on, but we don't have the, the 
the results of that consultation back. So it's very difficult to, to say whether the, the scientific evidence supports a move to DZR because we don't know exactly what that move to DZR will mean. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts or views on, on that? Nothing from me on that. No. Okay. I mean, but perhaps if I could perhaps pitch this a slightly different way to you then. I mean, you've already mentioned the kind of regulatory regimes that we have in Norway and Iceland that are very much focused on achieving environmental objectives. How do you see DZR, because there has been a consultation on it, so you're aware of what's coming in broad terms. How do you see DZR compared to those kind of regulatory regimes that are very much focused on delivering environmental objectives first and foremost? Yeah. Yeah, so if I, I think, I, could I return us to the topic of adaptive uh, ma management versus the precautionary pr principle? Yeah. So, what, I mean, adaptive management is learning by doing. <laughs> okay. uh, and so, uh, it allows development to go ahead without being absolutely clear about what the environmental effects will be. Uh, but... Uh, it assumes that environmental effects will be mo monitored and that knowledge of those effects will then change management practice as necessary. So one, one can see the changes to the DZR uh, in that framework that uh, if it allows or encourages the industry and particular farms uh, to monitor the condition of the seabed in such a way that their management practice changes, then it will be su successful. So, so I understand this is what you mean in saying is it, it's preferable to set a standard <laughs> and then uh, allow a fish farm to find its own way of achieving that standard rather than to try to regulate it in terms of saying this is the maximum stock that you may hold at a site. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I. If, if, that's, if, if I'm heading in the right direction, I'd like to go on a little more with my, uh -huh. with my, 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 my answer. Um, so the important question here then is, what are the circumstances in which adaptive management can be properly implemented and will succeed? So this, this clearly requires some changes in the way we all think uh, about it. And it includes changes in the way that the public think about the what the regulator is required to to do <laughs> so if if the regulator is seen as police uh, there to enforce mm -hmm. specific regulations <coughs> about stock then this sets up a confrontational situation uh, th there is a degree of adaptive management at the moment which comes about because in my experience regulators talk with farmers uh, and r in many cases are able to uh, guide the farms in how they may change their practice or their stock you know, without the need for a confrontational court, court case. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I've been associated with the European Research Programme which has done research into public attitudes and what this leads to is some public concern you know, about whether the regulators are doing their job pro properly. Mm -hmm. So in, in my view, an improvement to environmental, to uh, adaptive management would also include bringing in probably two additional groups of people. One, one would be research scientists, and the other would be what I think of as the citizen mm. scientists, so members of the community who are sufficiently interested um, in these issues from either the pro-industry or anti-industry side, but who are sufficiently interested to be willing to contribute some time in taking part uh, in some aspects of the monitoring Pro process, uh, mm -hmm. and we have we have a good example of that in SAMS at the moment in citizen science, looking at uh, seashore uh, co communities. Um, so but that would require full transparency from industry. It, it would require yes. full full transparency. And and there, 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 are, there are clearly issues around that, um, and this is not something I would recommend as a panacea, but it's something I think that could be usefully introduced under experimental conditions. Mm -hmm. to see how well it works. I'm sure there are some, there are some farms, some farming organisations that probably would welcome this, mm -hmm. this a approach and be willing to go along with it. So uh, do, you, do you believe then that this DZR approach should be applied to every fish farm, including the existing sites, 
inshore or should it just be restricted to expansions or, or new sites and more exposed locations? Um, I, Where do you draw the line if this is a good thing? Yes. Well, I'm, I think I'm saying that adaptive management is a good thing. Uh, I don't have strong views on the change from a okay. allowable zone of effect to D, DZR. Um, I think what, what I would like to see is some, what you might call experimental social science, some monitoring of not only how, not only the environmental conditions it farms which have switched to the new system, but also some monitoring of the way management is working and interacting as part of an adaptive management process and how the local community feels about this, whether they are engaged, whether it's changing their views uh, yeah. of the impact of the industry. Okay. And I've just got another question, again, this relates to nutrients and around uh, the issue of efficiency uh, and the prospect of uh, multi-trophic aquaculture systems, obviously producing multiple products. Um, what, what, what do you think is, is the potential for this? I mean, if, you, if we accelerate to 2030 and the, the industry's uh, anticipated growth, I mean, where do you see multi-trophic aquaculture sitting within that? Yeah. So the, the, the concept of integrated aquaculture or multi-trophic aquaculture is, as you say, the, the waste products from one uh, production level, so in this case salmon, are, can be utilised by seaweeds or by mussels, so you, you reduce the environmental impact and you increase the growth of the, the species you're co-culturing. And the idea is really attractive, but the, the, the practicalities of it are difficult at a farm scale, and it, you really need to go back to the question of what you're trying to achieve by, by implementing this multi-trophic system. So if you are trying to balance out nutrient uh, budgets over the scale of the farm, it's, it's really quite difficult to, to do because uh, the, the sp there's a spatial mismatch between uh, the amount of space it takes to produce 1,000 tonnes of salmon and the amount of space it takes to produce 1,000 tonnes of mussels. And roughly, if you want to... Uh, a 1,000 tonne fish farm might be a hectare. If you want to take up 10% of those nutrients through IMTA, you're going to need about 10 hectares of mussels or uh, seaweed. So, so at, at a farm scale, that's really difficult to, to imagine that happening because you know, that's a huge increase in the production at any one site. If you were to start thinking about this at an ecosystem level where you were trying to balance the nutrient inputs from aquaculture and the nutrient reductions from things like mussel farming or seaweed farming, then you may get a more uh, viable model, a model that works better uh, when you move away from the farm scale to the ecosystem scale. But, but the, the benefits of the IMTA or integrated aquaculture may be bigger than just uh, looking at nutrient budgets. The, the, there's... Uh, a diversification of aquaculture in there. There's development, new business, small businesses, rural economies, social acceptance of aquaculture. So I, I, I think if, if you're, the reason you're looking into IMTA is solely to balance nutrient budgets at the scale of a farm, then, then there's a lot of logistical problems with that. If you're looking at it as a more holistic tool to, to look at an ecosystem approach to aquaculture to balance social need, etc., then I think th there's more value in it. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move on to the issue of escapes from fish farms and the impact that has. Angus McDonald. Okay, uh, thanks, convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. Um, Eric uh, Versper has already uh, touched on the issue of, of escape, escapees uh, earlier. However, we, we see in the report uh, that in Scotland, between October 2002 and October 2017, approximately 2.2 million Atlantic salmon were reported to, to have escaped. Um, now, we see what's called um, or referred to as drip escapes, which uh, are difficult to identify and quantify uh, and are not encompassed by reported escape events, but it's been estimated in Norway uh, that uh, it, it is quite substantial. Um, and we know, of course, that the, the causes of the escapes are, are human error, holes in the nets, um, predators, and, and, of course, the weather. So. How concerned should we be about um, escapes, given that, the, uh, and I quote from the report, the majority of salmon that escape from farms will not survive to interact with wild fisheries populations, end quote. Uh, and how can we be sure that uh, the salmon escapes um, 
won't survive uh, to, to interact. Um, research that's been done in Norway and in part in, in Ireland um, indicate that uh, even moderate levels, low levels of introgression of farm genes into wild populations can affect the normal life history characteristics of the populations in those rivers. And once you disturb the normal life history characteristics, then you will most likely increase mortality rates. So it will compound the mortality rates that will be caused by other factors. In general, these populations also show declines over on average. So the genetic mixing of farm stocks uh, with wild stocks will almost inevitably have negative consequences if it occurs. In Norway, they found levels of mixing of to be highly variable from about 5 to 10 percent up to 50 to 60 percent. And these are not, are generally associated with uh, rivers that are in areas of farming as opposed to rivers that aren't. But equally, there are some rivers in farming areas that aren't impacted, and there are some rivers outside of farming areas which are impacted. So it's difficult to predict. What they have done in Norway is a system of monitoring. They have developed genetic markers that they can go into populations and they can estimate levels of integration. So they actually have an indication of uh, the extent to which their impact on the assumption that, uh, uh, which is supported quite well by the science that integration ha will have negative impacts then you can look at then managing that situation and, and knowing you have to reduce the, the levels of escapes in those areas to bring those levels of genetic mixing down. This is the adaptive management approach that the Icelandic government is going to be putting in place. It has been approved and it will be the way that the industry is guided in the future. If there is no evidence for integration, the industry on that criteria will be allowed to expand. If there is evidence for integration, the industry will have to take measures to reduce those levels before it's allowed to expand, or they will be asked to decrease production levels to a point where it is no longer a problem. This is the principle of adaptive management. In Scotland, we have very little information on levels of integration. We do know, we have evidence historical going back to the early 90s, that escaped farm fish do ascend rivers, they do reproduce, and we have subsequent, some evidence of integration, but it's imperfect. We had to use the Norwegian uh, molecular markers, which are specifically designed for Norway in Scotland, and that didn't allow us to get an accurate assessment of integration. It was suggestive. Then on the other hand, I studied a very small river in, on the west coast, which is in the middle of a farming area. And, well, we didn't even know there was a wild salmon population there. We looked at it. There was no evidence of intergression, despite it being a population probably composed of a few tens of breeding individuals. So this can be highly variable. The only answer to this is that we need to monitor on a regular basis levels of introgression in Scottish wild stocks. And then we can manage according to what the actual effect is, knowing that if the introgression does occur, it is extremely likely that there will be negative impacts to some degree, probably scaling with the level of introgression. Okay, are you aware of any molecular or um, uh, genetic uh, marking going on in Scotland? At all? Well, there's, there's different ways of, uh, of actually addressing the issue. In Norway, they have uh, markers that will indicate whether uh, the level of integration. They also have markers which allow them to uh, associate farm escapes with particular cages. So if they have a farm escape event, 
they can actually then go to the local farms, get samples of fish from those farms, and they can then see where those escaped farm, or farm fish may have come from. And they've been quite successful. They can do that using genetic markers, or they can also use it by uh, profiling the lipids in, in the fish because the feed that they're being given and the, uh, uh, can also uh, be quite unique uh, as well. Um, in Scotland, we tried to apply, it's myself, Mark Coulson, who's a co-author on, on, on it, tried to apply these Norwegian markers, but they weren't accurate enough in terms of distinguishing farm and wild fish. We are, we've currently just completed a UK Research Council grant where we're identifying genes for domestication, which should give us better markers that allow us to actually go into any river, identify farm fish, identify hybrids between farm and wild fish, and measure the extent of intergression. Not fully, but we should be able to do what the Norwegians are doing. Um, that is, we have now a uh, European Structure Innovation Fund uh, studentship where we will be actually going and looking at historical samples and contemporary samples and looking for evidence of intergression. Okay, that, that's good to hear. Um, can we, I've got a couple of questions on RAS. Do you want me to wait? Yeah, we'll come to that in a moment. Okay. Can I just wrap this section up, um, just to get clarity on something that's in the report? Uh, it says at bullet point 5.8, experiments to develop triploid strains have so far not proven commercially successful. Does that mean that it can be done, it's just too costly, or, or is it a, a, a bigger picture issue than that? No, um, it is, it's fairly inexpensive to produce triploids. Uh, the, the question about triploids is their performance. Uh, the economics of them, are they more susceptible to disease? Uh, do they grow as well? Um, and the, there has been, well, since the early 90s, people have been playing with triploids to see whether they would be suitable. But it's, it's uh, sometimes they find that the performance is equivalent, sometimes they find the performance is superior, other times they find it's inferior. Um, but the fact that the industry hasn't taken it up, I think, suggests that they have, for some reason, it doesn't work for them. It may be public perceptions. Do people perceive of triploids as being genetically modified? Um, depends on your definition of genetic modification. John Scott. Is there any <coughs> other way I'm thinking of livestock farming that you can physically inhibit the breeding characteristics of fish were they to escape into the wild? <coughs> Is there any other way that you can physically inhibit the, the breeding characteristics of fish um, yes. escapees were they to escape to yes, the wild? Yes, there, there potentially is. I mean, so um, farm strains are currently selected for the um, traits which are of economic value, such as growth rate and, and delayed maturation or disease resistance. But they're also inadvertently selected for domestication. So fish that are happy to live in cages tend to survive and, and that aren't, uh, are more docile. But there are other traits which are not of relevance to a production which could be potentially selected for in breeding programs, for example, the tendency to migrate, uh, the ability to reproduce successfully. There's a whole behavioral repertoire that's associated with su successful reproduction in the wild. You don't need that in a farm setting because they're spawned artificially. So th there's stress-related uh, uh, traits as well. They're important in the wild. You have to be a little bit uh, nervous in the wild in case you get predated upon. In the farm context, it's, it's, you, you can change those traits. Uh, Stress-related things are not advantageous. So yes, there are other traits that could be brought in, but the gain, the immediate economic gain in terms of production isn't there, but there could be a, a longer term environmental gain by making them less able to breed in the wild, 
so they don't run up rivers to, sp to spawn for example. Fish that want to stay at home, want to stay near their cage and stay near their source exactly. of food are likely to be the ones that do best anyway. Yes, yeah. exactly. There is some potential that it hasn't been explored yet. There is some, some uh, uh, how do you say, uh, hope that in the coming years we might explore those possibilities. Fascinating. Okay. Thank you. Let's uh, move on to uh, feed supplies. Uh, Richard Lyle. Um, Paul Tate actually touched on my question earlier and was, I think it was one of your top issues in regards to sustainability of feed supplies, including substitution within plant-derived ingredients. So, uh, we've went up from 130 tonnes to 170-odd tonnes uh, fish, salmon being farmed. We want to double that to over three, 300 tonnes uh, um, so basically, how do we feed and can we sustain? And if Norway's doing the same, how can we feed the fish? And will it mean, as your report said, that increasing salmon production in Scotland and elsewhere, i.e. Norway, will necessarily increase the demand for raw materials for feed? The required additional sustainable source of omega-3 could be obtained from wait for it, transgenic or organic crops, oil seed, or as commonly known as GM crops. Oops, nobody wants that in Scotland. We banned it. So what do we do? So I think the, the inclusion of marine ingredients in uh, salmon feed is mainly an issue driven by the consumer. So in Norway, it's down to about 20%. In Scotland, it's around 25% marine ingredients as part of the fish feed. But that, that, uh, that's because the UK consumer prefers a product which is higher in marine ingredients, which is seen as more natural because it's fed on fish. So uh, there has been complete substitution of uh, marine oils for vegetable oils in uh, salmon feed. And there's very little difference in the growth rates. So, but what you don't have at the end of that process is you don't have a product which is full of omega-3 oils which are good for public health. So I think the, the substitution for of marine ingredients can continue as, as far as we want for terrestrial ingredients, but we lose a lot of the health benefits and a lot of the consumer acceptance of the product. So, with the greatest respect to me, uh, uh, you, um, what is the answer? Is the answer to allow GM crops? Is it, is it um, to try and uh, look at, you know, and, and the point my colleague made earlier, 2 million fish lost, 25% of them culled, you know, so they, they were fed. Um, so, does the industry need to be get better in order to sustain and to grow, or do we just let you know? Do we do we just let rip and let everything come back in, which I don't think a lot of people would agree with. I think the issue of GM is something for society to decide. Scotland's made a very clear statement that uh, they don't want GM uh, products to be farmed. In Scotland, as I understand, <laughs> so that that's a societal uh, decision that's been made. It, it's nothing to do with the science necessarily. So, uh, other options are the, the there's at the moment most of the or a large proportion of the marine ingredients is sourced from uh, South America, from the the, the uh, anchoveta fisheries uh, along the Peruvian coast. Uh, those fisheries are at the limit of their sustainable exploitation, though most of them are well uh, managed. There, there's no real room for expansion there. The, there is an increasing use of discards and fish byproducts to create uh, fish oil, and that has, in some respects, met that demand. But I think there are developing technologies, uh, microalgal oils, uh, uh, bacterially produced oils, which may produce the oils that's required to go into the fish feed only so that we can get the public health benefit out of eating those salmon. And that, that shouldn't be under, underestimated because salmon is a major source of omega-3s 
to the Scottish population. And uh, that has huge health benefits. So last question. Do you honestly think the industry's desire to double the production in the next number of years is achievable? Or would you like to pass on that question? <clears throat> on terms of feed, in terms product, of feed. feed production, I think it is achievable because no matter what the Scottish industry does, the Norwegian industry is going to be an order of magnitude ten times larger than the Scottish industry, and they will have to come up with solutions for exactly the same problem. So there are technological solutions out there. There are societal solutions out there. It's what, what we choose to adopt. Thank you. Crosscom. You mentioned the um, South American um, anchovetta fishery. Um, at what point do you think within the next 10 to 15 years will that fishery start to tip over it, its total allowable catch? At wh which point will it be exceeding maximum sustainable yield and, and will therefore be in a state of collapse? I don't have that information, I'm afraid. That's outside my area of expertise. It's, it's fisheries management. But probably. Well, as I understand it, it is sustainably managed at the moment, which means it's managed at maximum sustainable yield. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is much fluctuation from year to year, you know, depending on the El Nino cycle. Um, but uh, it seems unlikely that we can expect much more fish from that uh, fishery. Um, and if it's not managed sustainably, well, we might get more fish from it for a few years, um, oh but then we'll, yeah. we will have exhausted it. But the, the present information is that it is managed sustain sustainably and it's giving us as much as it can. Yeah. So there are probably, there are, there are, there don't seem to be any other major sources of fish oil available from the natural world at the moment. Okay, so we're at the limit. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Could, 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 I just, could I add one more thing? Because the one um, Adam, Adam mentioned one of the possible technologies is, is growing what the industry calls mic microalgae mm -hmm. to produce omega-3s. Um, in, in fact, they're not what I would call algae because they don't photosynthesize. Uh, the, the promising method seems to be a sort of fermentation te technology. So it's more like brewing. <laughs> So um, my guess here is Scotland is pretty good at brewing, <laughs> so maybe this is an industry we, we could develop. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a brief question about acoustic deterrent devices, ADDs, um, and specifically it's around the assertion in the report 7.1.5 that most acoustic deterrent devices are left to operate continuously. Can I ask what evidence there is for that? Because I seem to recall in the last parliament, on the RACI committee, we were told that these devices would and should only be used in short bursts, as otherwise they'd be harmful to the wider marine environment, um, or occupants of the wider marine uh, environment. So that, that would be quite a concerning assertion in the report. I just want to flesh that out briefly. Yeah. Okay, so I think this, 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 this comes to me uh, again. Um, but I confess that I don't know the precise answer to that. The, what I'm aware of is there's very limited available documentation on what sort of devices are used and under mm -hmm. what conditions and what is their, what is their uh, for how long they operate and for how long they're, they're not operating. So, so how have you um, um, backed up that assertion then? Okay, I can't answer that directly. We will find out. That's been written by um, one of the other experts at SAM, so we can look into that for you. And Could you come back to me on that? Because that's a, at and face value, that's an, an obvious concern. Yep. Because it does raise a question of the, the need for consistent ADD monitoring and perhaps a licensing regime. It's quite an important point if you could come back to us on that. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the issue of uh, RAS, uh, Angus MacDonald. Um, convener, um, during the course of the Aquaculture Bill in 2014, the, the former RACI committee he took evidence during a fact-finding visit to uh, Lochaber, um, and at that time, uh, marine harvest were already using RAS to control um, lice infestations. Now, I'm not sure when they introduced them, but uh, there seems to be more and more widespread use of RAS since then. Uh, in fact, um, according to the report, uh, official statistics show that 1.7 million lump suckers and one million RAS were bought by the Scottish farming industry in 2016. So overall, um, 
does the evidence show that the, the commercial rearing of wrasse and lump suckers is a sustainable approach to controlling lice in the Scottish salmon industry? Um, and do you have any concerns about future increased demand for, for cleaner fish, um, particularly given that salmon production is set to increase significantly in Scotland and in Norway, which presumably there's only so many of the wrasse that can be bought, so demand will be pretty excessive? The question for me again. So the the information we have is that um, cultivation of lump suckers uh, seems to be capable of supplying the demand. Uh, okay. uh, the situation is not so clear cut with with RAS. So information from the industry suggests that they would like to be able to rear to cultivate all the RAS they use um, to cultivate. By, this is by 2019. Um, but it's not clear whether that's an achievable target. Uh, so if, if, if it's not achievable, then clearly the demand for wild wrasse will continue. Uh, and in that case, then I think there will be a need for fisheries management of the wrasse fishery. Um, follow, follow an example that's begun to be developed in southwest England, where there's a local fisheries management board that uh, has successfully managed the wrasse fishery uh, in such a way that it provides a sustainable source of employment uh, for people in that part of the country, and much of the export of those RAS then comes to Scotland. Okay. Okay, thanks. And uh, the, the killer question if the use of uh, cleaner fish is so widespread, why is lice still a problem? So uh, this is where we need more research. <laughs> I, think. Um, I, mean, I suppose what, what, what seems to be the case is that the industry probably needs a whole portfolio of different lice control me methods, some biological, some chemical, some physical. physical. Uh, but I have not seen published information as to what is the optimum mixture <laughs> of the different methods. And again, it might vary from site to site, uh, depending both on the cultivation conditions for the salmon and the hydrographic conditions in which the farm is situated. Um, certainly temp temperature plays a part as, as well. Rass are warm water <coughs> fish. Uh, lump suckers are cold water fish. So the northern Norwegians prefer lump suckers, both because they grow more quickly when they're reared um, and because they're more active in the cold temperatures in northern Nor Norway. Um, so that's an issue which I think is still to be decided in the Scottish fishery. We, we hear a lot about RAS, but when you look at the numbers, then clearly lump suckers are also imp important. Uh, and if I remember rightly, um, lump suckers can be reared in a few months, whereas RAS take more than a year to, to rear in, in a hatchery. So there are clearly economic aspects here. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, let's just, as we move to wrap this up, uh, turn to mitigation. Um, Alex Riley. I must confess, Chair, when I saw the BBC programme, I thought that, that RAS or lump suckers, that was the solution. But in the report itself, you talk about the recirculating aquaculture systems, um, enclosed systems, which would seem to be the solution. So I suppose the question is, what are the main environmental concerns related to enclosed systems? Could they become the main means of salmon production in Scotland? Uh, for the future. Is that the answer? If not, why not? If yes. <clears throat> uh, just looking at the environmental side, uh, the, the, the probably the main concerns with uh, recirculation systems are dealing with the solid waste which comes out of... Because uh, you still generate the same amount of solid waste except you're generating it either in land or in an enclosed system at sea. So that needs to be dealt with some way. It's a saline waste, so it may not be suitable for uh, the standard things like uh, uh, biodigesters, etc., which you, you might use on a farm. But there are, you can run a biodigester on saline waste. It just needs to be dedicated to that. Uh, or, you know, there's other ways of reusing that land, uh, reusing that uh, material. Uh, in terms of the disease control, obviously you have much better disease control, including lice control, that you, you are controlling the water that comes in and you're controlling what goes out. So, it is certainly an option for uh, development of the industry, and one of the reasons the, the industry is so interested in it is because of to try and reduce the uh, impact of lice. So, 
But I go back to my earlier comments about the economics and making it uh, economically viable for the industry uh, to, to develop that. But we also, as I say, have the societal concerns that the, the perception of natural versus unnatural. Uh, and also, when you to make some of the economics work for recirculation systems, you, you increase the stocking density well beyond what you, you would do in an open water system. Again, that has animal implications, it also, uh, animal welfare implications, also has societal implications about where we judge those standards to be. So. I suppose in terms of natural, it depends on what we define as being natural in terms of the amount of salmon that you see packed into these cages. But I think John Scott said earlier that it was more an engineering solution that, that, that you would be looking at for this. Could you say a bit more about the economics there? Would that, would that mean far more investment by the salmon producers, the companies, in order to, 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 to reach a situation where, where we had these, these enclosed systems that were much safer environmentally? Okay. Uh, the, the, the capital expenditure to set up a recirculation plant is much more expensive than to set up an open water cage system, and all, as are your running costs to a certain degree. But that, that all depends on how much you offset against having the uh, better control of that life cycle and a lower disease impact. So I, I can't make a, an economic analysis. Uh, that's something for the salmon companies to do. But obviously, at the moment, they, that economic balance is not tipping towards recirculation systems, or else they would be widespread adopt adoption of the technology. So. Okay, can, can I finally just ask... Throughout this evidence session, there, there is, it seems to me, a lack of data in so many areas and a lack of research in so many areas. And the Norwegians seem to be so much further ahead than us in terms of investment and in terms of research. Would that be a fair analysis or conclusion to draw? Uh, in my opinion, absolutely. Absolutely. I think the level of investment uh, in research in Norway is much higher than it is in Scotland, but also the level of technology development within this uh, Norwegian uh, aquaculture industry is much more advanced than what we have in Scotland. So. Okay, thank you. John Scott. Um, oh, thank you. And finally, um, you've spoken at some length about adaptive management systems, um, and I think you've pretty well said that that would be a good idea if we were to pursue that as a direction of travel. Would you just like to agree? That that I, would I would like to agree, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Just so that we have it on the record very exactly. definitely. It, it's essentially evidence-based management in, in, in an adaptive way. Yeah. So you, as your evidence accumulates, your management gets better because you're basing it on this expanding body of information and understanding of, of the system. And in a real-time basis... To, I think you yes. said, given the ability that we now have, that we didn't have probably even 10 years ago, to real, in real time understand populations of lice and things. Indeed, and I, th I, think there, I think there is also the very important point that uh, Paul made, and that is that to also include communities, individuals and society in a way that perhaps hasn't been included currently. Um, to minimise uh, conflicts. And, uh, yes, we take that. Okay. Lord, too. Thank you very much. And, and finally, well, finally, two very brief supplementaries. Mark Roscoe and then Claudia Beamish. Just, just further on that point, you, you spoke earlier on about adaptive management versus the precautionary approach. I mean, isn't the reality that we need a kind of hybrid because there are still elements, and we talked earlier about the cocktail effects of chemicals, where perhaps a precautionary approach may be needed, but there are other elements where we've got some understanding, there's a lack of monitoring and research. Is that fair to characterise that? Or yes. do you see it as very, you have a precautionary approach or you have adapted? No, 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 I think what you say is very apt. Yes, well, I mean, we need a mixture of precaution and adaptive management. Uh, of course, it's a judgment about how much precaution is needed. And I think that, then that judgment goes back to what the, the risks of any particular issue, you know, are the risks likely to be unmitig unmitigatable in the long term, or are they risks that we can recover from? Uh, so, yeah. uh, just Tom, I mean, the research that has to be done has to be on the monitoring of, of the levels to to look at compliance with standards, but the research has to also be into the standards because we often don't understand enough to know what is 
a standard that is appropriate or not. So really, and that's part of adaptive management is, is both monitoring and researching your standards. And finally, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Going forward, could I ask um, if any of you wish to comment um, from a scientific perspective on um, the relationship, or indeed not, of um, fish farms and marine protected areas and other marine protections? In terms of whatever you want to say, briefly. Can I? Uh, I, 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 I was an author on a paper that dealt with this issue across Europe uh, last year. So I think... The, the, the conclusions that uh, the working group we were involved with that put the paper together was that MPAs normally have a specific purpose why they've been designated an MPA. So it may be mole beds, it may be transitory cetacean populations. So what if, if aquaculture is to be cited within those MPAs, and there's a lot of examples in Scotland where aquaculture is cited within MPAs, you need to understand what the impacts of that aquaculture industry is going to be on the specific uh, designation of, or the specific objective of the protection of that MPA. So, uh, you know, if, if the MPA was around merle beds, for instance, the example we've used, we, you wouldn't put uh, a fin fish farm over the top of it. But if the MPA was around wading birds, for instance, or a shoreline feature, and, and the farm was off the coast, then as long as the appropriate process has been through and, and this Scotland has quite a robust system for this, then the, using a risk assessment approach that the, the, there is no impact on the conservation feature that the MPA is trying to protect, then I, I, there is no reason why MPAs and aquaculture can't coexist in the same space. So. Thank you very much uh, for your time this morning. That's been very useful in sort of teasing out some of the detail in the report. Uh, as I say, I thank you for your time. And we will suspend now for five minutes uh, to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back uh, to, we will now take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan, RPP3. I want to welcome Chris Stark, Director of Energy and Climate Change, Claire Hamilton, the Deputy Director and Head of Decarbonisation, and Michael King, from the head, head of Energy and the Climate Change Unit. Uh, welcome to you all. Apologies for the delay in kicking off this part of the evidence session. Um, I want to start this off by asking for some information around uh, specific changes that may be made to the plan as a result of stakeholder engagement since the publication of the draft. So, good morning, everyone. I'm um, very happy to answer that question. Um, if I could, I'd just like to make a, a short detour just to explain briefly what's happened since January, and then I'll okay. answer that question specifically. So, we've done, we've done an awful lot of work since January, since the draft plan, and indeed I've been before you to talk a bit about that, and in February you'll see the product of all that. I hope you like it. Um, but th th there are four ways in which I would categorise that, and the stakeholder work is one of, the, one of, the, one of those aspects. Um, so let's start with that. The first thing is that we've been through quite an extraordinary amount of scrutiny, actually, and we've done, on top of that, a lot of work with stakeholders in each of the sectors and on the plan itself, which I'll talk about in just a second. We've also done a few other things, though. Um, we've developed our model, and Mike here is the architect of that. Um, we have made quite a number of revisions to the data so that we are more accurate in the way that we uh, view the future. Um, and we've also introduced some new measures, and it's probably there that there, you see the kind of biggest interaction with the stakeholder work. So th th over the past 12 months or so, I think there's a really good story, actually, of how much we have done to amend, to consider, and to respond. Um, and that has included this work with, with stakeholders. So, I mean, I mean I could, there's been a, a heck of a lot done both by my team, but also by the, what, we, what we know as the sector teams, that is the teams who work on each of the sectors within the climate change plan. Um, and uh, we can talk about that in a second. Um, just a few highlights, really, from some of those things. We've worked very extensively with the public sector, uh, which is something I know the committee's uh, been very interested in. Um, uh, I've done a number of things as has the Cabinet Secretary to work with various aspects of the, of the public sector to understand their views. Um, we might uh, also draw in uh, just a couple of examples of where we've done some deeper stakeholder work. Um, I, we will, I'm sure, refer to on a number of occasions in this appearance the plan that we're bringing together on energy efficiency uh, this year. And that has been very informed by a number of stakeholder sessions that we've held. Um, we are in the midst now of putting the final detail around the plan, which I hope will be a 20-year plan for improving the energy efficiency of particularly the building stock in Scotland, which is greatly influenced by stakeholders, uh, particularly industry stakeholders. Um, and I might, also, I, I might also draw your attention to the transport work, which has also been um, uh, you know, an area where we've responded, I think, especially to the views of this committee in setting new policies, most obviously in the programme for government around um, uh, what we know as ULEVs, ultra low emission vehicles, um, and active travel, and, uh, and low emission zones. All of those things really are the product of deep stakeholder engagement, and I'm personally quite proud of the fact that we've done that. But what specific examples could you give us of changes? Let, let's, let's go beyond the stakeholders. Let's look at what the, the criticisms that the parliamentary committee has made of the original plan, the draft. Um, could you give us examples of changes that have been made directly as a consequence of those that commentary? Um, so let me draw, I should probably preface this by saying I, I can't reveal the final plan, as no, you'd I expect, that's that. something in February, although I do my best to tell you as much as I can about it. The um, two areas where I think we felt particularly, uh, it was particularly important to respond, um, one on CCS, um, and, uh, and I might add into that um, CCS plus biofuels. Um, and the criticism we received on what I think we can describe as a highly ambitious uh, projection for decarbonised heat. Um, we've, we've worked really hard to amend that in the final plan, again, without revealing it. So we, 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 we certainly feel, my team at least feels, that the the work we've done with transport, especially, helps us to address, I think, the very legitimate criticism of that decarbonised heat run. 
And I think we, I might also agree that the projections we had for CCS, particularly with, for negative emissions, were highly ambitious. So these are things that we've been able to amend and you will see in the final plan. They're very much a direct product of that scrutiny and that, um, that criticism that we received at the time. Uh, so again, without giving you full details of how we've responded to that, these are areas where I think you can look forward to seeing quite a different plan in the future. Okay. Okay, let's move on and look at the monitoring and evaluation framework, uh, Kate Forbes. Along similar lines, you were discussing there the um, impact that stakeholder engagement has had um, on the draft plan. How has the Scottish Government engaged with stakeholders, including the Committee on Climate Change, in terms of developing the monitoring and evaluation framework? So again, it's another area where I don't mind saying in January when we published the draft plan, uh, this was not, a f not as fully fleshed as, as I hoped it would be. So we've done a lot of work again on monitoring evaluation and I think we will continue to do that work. So um, we have done uh, with the CCC some advanced work to, to, to show them uh, how we are planning to develop the framework for monitoring and evaluation. We did that um, by going to them early, so demonstrating, particularly I think Mike with the electricity sector, how we might set some, um, some metrics, and crucially how we would embed that properly in the plan and, the, and in the policies that, that sit in that plan for each of the sectors. Um, what you will see in February when we produce the final plan is a very well, I hope at least, a very well embedded set of metrics around uh, that allow you to monitor and, and evaluate how we are doing in the future. Um, I, I, th I want to say here that that is very much an ongoing process. So I mentioned earlier, for example, the, the energy efficiency plan that we're bringing together at the moment. At the end of that, when we produce that plan, the current assumption is that we'll do something in May to, to launch the final plan. Um, we will, alongside the development of that policy, also consider how we'll measure it. So it's, it's a, in each sector, there is a very live process of considering ways in which we can track progress against the things that we say that are important. Um, one of the ways that we'll do that in the future is by producing an annual report. Plan to do that in October this year. Um, the, it, it's difficult to talk in substance about how each of those things look until you see the plan itself. But there are, I think, a good set of metrics, and crucially, they're timely. So you'll be able to see, uh, in most occasions at least, in most sectors at least, that you know, when, when we are off track or when we are on track, that will be something you'll be able to track annually at least and something that this committee I'm sure will be interested in in the future. It's an ongoing process and in that sense I suppose there is a role for this committee in defining how you want to scrutinise those things too. So that's, a, that's something that I'm sure you'll want to return to once you see the final plan. Um, again, it's been a pro there has been a stakeholder process alongside those things, so we think these are um, metrics and uh, forms of evaluation that will mean something to each of the key stakeholders in each of those sectors. Um, and it's something I hope that's, that's live in the sense that we don't set them and let them go. There are things that, we, as, as the policies and proposals develop in each of those sectors, we'll also develop the monitoring and evaluation framework. Very live thing, um, but in the plan in February, I think you will be happier with that we have a proper framework around this, happier at least than that it, it has improved at least since February when we spoke. Thanks. Okay, you any so, sorry, you, you suggested there that you would publish the annual report in October of this year. Is that the intention timing wise for future years because that would actually sit relatively well with the budget? Yeah, I, think, I mean, that, that's the intention, but again, I. I I think it's up to you. If you if you like to see something different, then I'm sure we could we can we can accommodate that. Okay, that's something we can reflect upon as a committee. Let's move on to emission envelopes and ambitions. John Scott. Um, thank you uh, very much, Katrina, and I, I'm pleased to hear that you've been interacting with stakeholders and developing um, the draft plan. And I just wonder um, what progress you've made. And I appreciate you may or may not be able to tell us, of course, but the, the level of ambition for emission reductions um, in the transport sector and the agriculture sector, and, and again, have to declare an interest as a, as a farmer. But if you could tell us a little bit about that, I'd be very grateful. So I mentioned earlier the four ways in which we've been amending the plan. Um, and I, I, you've picked out two of the sectors where you will probably see the, the, you know, the, the product of that. Um, 
when it comes to transport, I don't mind saying that we will have, you know, I think greater ambition here, that you can see that written into the programme for government, for example. And a great deal of that has, I would say that a great deal of that is climate led. So, you know, with a programme on transport that is responsive to um, the critiquing and criticism that we received on the draft plan. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I hope at least in the plan that you, that you scrutinise in the future, once it is published, that you will see a greater ambition around transport. Um, I think it's worth saying, though, that... Uh, Any specific areas that you want to go into? Well, I, I don't mind drawing out the things that were published. So, uh, you, as you might expect, there is an impact from... Uh, our, our, well, let me deal with the three issues in transport as I see them. Um, there is the active, active travel package, um, which is, I think, actually one of, the, one of the biggest things that we've done. The headline-grabbing thing was the the commitment on ULEVs, which is eight years in advance of a similar commitment from the UK government. And then there are low emission zones, which are probably one of our primary routes to achieve the things that we say we want to achieve with transport. Um, all, I think that amounts to really quite an ambitious package on transport. There was already quite an ambitious package on transport. Um, and I think it's worth saying that. It's not that in any sense the thing that we published last year was weak. I just feel that there is more that we could do, and I'm pleased that we've done it, and you'll see that reflected in the plan. Um, on agriculture, I think there's a more interesting story. In each of the sectors we have come to understand better, as we've refined our analysis, how we need to um, approach the climate objectives that we've set for ourselves. We've understood more and more about how difficult it is in agriculture and indeed in land use to, uh, and uh, I'm keen not to leave you with any impression that we've stepped back in ambition from agriculture, but we have understood it is harder, let's put it that way. Uh, and I think you will see that in the plan too, again, without revealing exactly what's in it. I, I suppose we have discovered in the budget scrutiny the, the need for perhaps um, greater dissemination of information um, from uh, our esteemed science community who do have some of the solutions um, and that dissemination of knowledge to the rural communities I think needs to be better developed also um, that there is actually and I'm a great believer in the carrot rather than the stick approach, but I, I do think that there's perhaps a lack of awareness within the rural communities that this is something that the government is immensely keen on. There's a, a message to be put out there better than perhaps it has been thus far. Would you like to comment on I, that? I think thought? I might agree with that. And I, I, um, <laughs> you know, I, I go back to my earlier point that we have come to understand more and more about the challenges in agriculture. I mean, agriculture is doing very well as a sector in terms of its carbon um, absorption, uh, absorption um, and indeed emission. Um, there is, uh, I'm just drawing up the stats now, 2015 stats show that agriculture emissions are down by around 25% from baseline levels. So, I mean, there is a nice trend there that we would like to see continue. Um, I think the it, it is a more difficult sector to decarbonise. Um, and attitudes in uh, the agriculture sector matter immensely to that. So I might agree with you there that there is more that we can do with that sector to try and make this known to be a government priority. I would say there's an enormous level of ingenuity within that sector and if it becomes a mindset of, of practising farmers yeah. and those involved in the industry that this is something that we all actually want to really achieve. Uh, Subconsciously, I think that would have, in its own way, over the long term, an effect. On yeah, and I think we, we talk emission. occasionally about co-benefits, which isn't always a very accessible term. But there are there are benefits in every sector to addressing climate change. They vary, mm -hmm. and and developing a low carbon agriculture sector is also, a, I hope, a means to see that sector continue to thrive in the future. I think those are the arguments. I think we will need to make harder in the course of this plan. I don't believe they're incompatible. Mm. Um, Mark Roscoe and Claudia Beamish want to come in. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about transport because the original plan was predicated uh, on an increase in vehicle miles of, I think, about 27%, uh, which obviously makes you know a big difference uh, to the plan. Now, when Hamza Youssef was in front of this committee giving evidence on air quality on the 5th of December, he said to the committee that uh, we don't predicate our approach on increasing traffic. 
He went on to say, it would certainly give me concern if local transport strategies were predicated on increasing number of car journeys. What, what, what will the final uh, climate plan be predicated on? So we, we draw here on the work of my um, uh, colleagues in transport. And it's fair to say they have, they, they have uh, a well-developed and probably, probably the most developed view of appraising projects in the future that involves using what's called the transport model, in my mind. It, it does have within it a set of assumptions, and we have not tried to change those assumptions, although I would say if we are successful in, uh, in implementing the active travel package, I would expect those assumptions to change in the future, and you will see that. Um, I Do, think it's important to say sorry, that those... Sorry, could I interrupt? Just, Go ahead. just briefly, um, the, the Transport Minister has said that you do not predicate your approach on increasing traffic. That's in relation to air quality. But you're saying the approach in the climate plan is still based, is still predicated on increasing levels of traffic. There are a set of Can assumptions. You see there's a, a bit of a mismatch there. Uh, no, I, th there are a set of assumptions that are contained within the, the modelling that is done by my transport colleagues that we, we are happy to adopt, so we, we take them. I th they are not predictive in so the sense which, of... which set of assumptions? I'm afraid assumptions I'm not familiar there are, specifically there on them. There isn't going to be an increase in traffic or the assumptions that there will be an increase in traffic. I don't know the specifics of it, I'm sorry, but I know that we, 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 do not, uh, we don't have a separate climate model for transport. We, we fall behind how the transport view the future. Um, the, they're not designed to be self-fulfilling prophecies, however, so that there are, I would expect if we are successful in some of the things that we're trying to do in transport, that those assumptions themselves would change. They're exogenous to the, the model that we use. So just, just to be clear, is the minister wrong? I, I, I have made no statement about whether the minister's right or wrong. I'm afraid I don't have the data in but front it, of me to answer that question. But his statement contradicts perhaps the, the data that is being received by your Transport Scotland colleagues in producing the climate plan. I, so I wouldn't want you to infer that I'm making any judgment at all about Mr Yousaf's view of the future. I'm just explaining how, we've, how, we, how we adopt the climate model and the transport models. Okay. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Good morning to you all. Uh, I, I've got one very brief question on transport and um, one supplementary to um, John uh, Scott's on agriculture. Um, is, is it the case that in terms of our recommendation as a committee in, term, in transport, as one of the heaviest emitters, um, that there was, not, uh, there was no rerun of the models? Is that the case? Because we did ask, we recommended that there should be a rerun and, and to um, have more of a focus on active travel in that. And I respect the fact that there's been increases in funding for active travel and, and all those issues, but I'm just asking well, for a clarification. So I, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Mike, who's, I, and I, I, let's just explain to the committee exactly how we've approached the transport work in the last 12 months. Yeah, so the, um, the transport analysis, uh, as Chris set out, I suppose, focuses on a report which was commissioned by Transport Scotland which um, was uh, produced by Ailment Energy, which set out a pathway for the transport sector. Now, that analysis has been updated since then over the summer to take account of the programme for government commitments. So that is, that is the, the transport analysis which now informs the development of the final plan. Um, and that is deemed to be the, the best analysis or the most, um, the most up-to-date evidence for how emissions will evolve within the transport sector. We have then taken that analysis and, um, and adopted that within the wider times framework to understand what the impacts are for all the sectors within the times modern framework. So that is the approach we've taken to, to transport modelling. Right. So if I'm understanding in layperson's terms, and don't think I'll ever understand the times model, because I'm sure I won't, but does that mean that the, um, that the active travel commitments in, in the government and the increase in, in the budget, in the programme for government, have now been included in um, your deliberations? Yes. Yes, right, thank you. And uh, just following on from my colleague John Scott's question, I, I respect his, um, his views, obviously, as, as someone who is, is a farmer. Uh, I would, however, highlight that it is agriculture, along with transport and housing, are you know the heaviest emitters. Uh, and so, is there, in your your view, um, a place for some compulsory um, 
focus, as well as the voluntary support, which I agree with um, my colleague, is very important. And um, I just highlight the fact that in it may be difficult in agriculture, um, it it's more diffuse, whatever, but in transport, we have a number of um, uh, compulsory arrangements which are being developed and they are in part to do with air pollution, but they're also in part to do with climate change and, and congestion and other issues. So could we have a comment on that, please, um, Chris? So I, I wouldn't make a... I mean, I, I don't feel I'm equipped to make a judgment on, on the most appropriate policy measures. I am content with what's in the plan, however. So, um, but you I, have already made a comment on, on agriculture in terms of thinking that the, there's some agreement from, from you... With, um, with John Scott, so I'm asking for your comment on the other side of the coin. So, the I mean, I acknowledge, that I acknowledge that it is important that we take uh, food producers, farmers with us in this process, um, and we've discussed the many reasons why that's a good idea. Um, I mean, I, that, our focus, that you'll see again, and it's difficult, I, I'd love to be able to say exactly what's in that plan, but I think you will know a great Not deal asking. of it. And I, I, exactly, I know. I, and I, um, I mean, I suppose that the, the, the right way to answer your question is that we will monitor the progress to that, uh, to monitor the progress against the goals that we've set in that plan. And again, this is when the monitoring and evaluation framework will come in. If we're not on track, then we'll reevaluate re our approach. So in, in those cases where, I mean, you're right to raise the transport example. That's, a, that's where we've built a good evidence base to do the things that we're doing. I, I, am, um, I, I think the agricultural work is good, actually. And I think in the future we will see, you know, the extent to which it maintains that trend that we've already seen. If there is an element of greater compulsion required, then if the evidence supports it, then that's something we can return to and reevaluate in our approach. But you are aware that our previous committee in the last session um, had concerns that, that it was perhaps time for there to be more compulsion. I yeah. just highlight that. Noted. Thank you. Can I just clarify something, uh, which I hope you will be able to answer? The elements of the programme for government around transport facilitate considerable or potentially facilitate considerable improvement in the performance of that particular sector. Does that take the plan in terms of overall ambition to a, a more ambitious place or has there been any rollback in any other sectors which would mean that effectively it, it's neutral in its performance? Um, so those are not, they're certainly not terms I would recognise. Have we readjusted amongst the, I wouldn't use those terms, to, um, mm -hmm. but have we readjusted between the sectors? Yes. So, for example, to address the, the very legitimate criticism that our projections on heat decarbonisation were very ambitious, we've made the plan, I think, more realistic. Okay. And one of the ways in which we are able to do that is by being more ambitious in some sectors than we were in, in January. Um, and I think transport is one of those. So um, we are still conscious of the need to... Uh, we, will, we will need to be incredibly successful in rolling out this plan if we are to meet our targets, even the targets we have now. And I believe we will be. But the, the harder we make this by having a, a, a harder headline target, the more we need to focus on making that a success. And that, that doesn't require us, that basically requires us to be very conscious in every sector about how much ambition we, we, we have. The, it is only, we, I, my ambition is that we overshoot wherever possible. So, so that, and again, you'll see that in the plan. So to be clear, you're saying that there, there will be changes there that might bring a raised eyebrow, but they are based on um, an outbreak of realism as opposed to just deciding it was probably too difficult to do. Definitely. That's okay. a very good way of characterising it. Okay. Um, let's move on to policies, proposals and assumptions. Um, Angus MacDonald. <coughs> yes, uh, thanks, Convener. I think this has uh, uh, partly been covered, uh, Convener, but clearly uh, everyone needs a, a plan B, and our committee report last March recommended the inclusion of a plan B where particular assumptions have been made. Uh, that may prove to be unfounded, particularly, uh, as you mentioned, in the case of uh, uh, CCS. Um, so just for uh, clarification, um, as I say, you've, you've mentioned CCS in your opening remarks, um, but have you produced 
Uh, any Plan B time scenarios uh, should any of the significant assumptions made in the plan, for example, that the reliance on CCS uh, fail to be deliverable? So uh, maybe worth saying just a little bit more about CCS. I know that's something that's been interesting to the committee. Um, and this is another area where you will see, I, just, I think, a change. So um, and I've made some reference to that. Um, the plan, I don't mind telling you specifically, without, without saying specifically what's in it, we are not projecting CCS before 2030. So effectively, this is a plan without CCS, and that's what we'll publish. It remains essential, however, um, to the future. So you've, the, the effort that we've been making in the last 12 years to maintain CCS as, a, as an option uh, with the funds and resources available to us in the Scottish Government is, 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 is essentially about making sure that we have that option available to us, and we are very pro-CCS. Um, I'm, I'm unhappy with referring to it as a plan B, however, so uh, you won't be surprised to hear me say that. Um, so this is a plan that still has CCS in it, albeit this is a set of projections now that doesn't rely on it, so that's the best way to describe it. Um, there are some other areas where we are um, uh, you know, changing the plan. It is, however, a plan, so I want to be clear on that, that this is the government's plan. Um, and we've thought a lot about, for example, scenarios and presenting those and those things in, in different ways. And, and we've concluded that actually this is, this is very much, it, it, the best way of going about this, we think, is to set a single plan, but to open ourselves up to scrutiny. And one of the ways in which we'll do that in the future, as I've said to the committee before, is that we'll, we'll put the model out, we'll allow others to do the inquisition that allows others to produce some of the scenarios that I know you've asked for in the past and use that as a basis in which we, we might you know, discuss future iterations of the plan. So you will see a single plan. It is a plan A, um, albeit amended uh, since the one that was published in, in, Jan in January last year. Okay, thank you. The caution. You touched on agriculture. Does the plan refer to any specific requirements regarding to so uh, soil testing? And uh, it was also commented on at earlier committee time about the lack of information regarding blue carbon. Is there, is there any, any mention of the potential of blue carbon? Um, so blue carbon, very happily, I can report, will be a part of the plan. And, uh, and that's a really good story, actually, of, uh, of the scrutiny that, that this process has put us under. Um, and indeed, uh, I'm quite excited, actually, by some of the things that are happening in blue carbon. I should say on blue carbon, although you will find that in the plan, it's not yet a part of the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. So that's, you'll see a, you know, a plan for that to be the case in the future. And I think Scotland should uh, you know, very much be in the lead on those things, given all the advantages that may come from having that as part of our inventory. Um, so blue carbon, you'll see in the plan, and indeed there's, um, there's a good story there. Um, on, on compulsory, uh, on soil testing and how compulsory it is, I'm afraid you'll have to wait till February to read it. Um, but I would draw back to the story I spoke earlier about when we spoke about the agricultural sector more generally and the elements of compulsion uh, are, have been subject to a great deal of scrutiny um, in this committee and in others and, uh, and there's been a very active internal process too that has led to the set of policies that you will see in the final plan. Look at that with interest. Um, on the subject of, let's develop the theme of realism. Um, Given the funding available in the draft Scottish budget for peatland restoration is considerably less than the current budget, um, has the draft uh, plan target to double planned peatland restoration um, been reduced? Well, you have to wait to publish the plan, of course. Uh, but um, the well, um, God loves a trial. God loves a trial, indeed, and. Uh, uh, we, I suppose the other thing to say is that we are still very actively discussing some of these things. So it is not. A, I don't want to be too dismissive of the question because there are uh, there are still areas where we are we are you know doing our best to resolve the final plan, um, and I therefore feel very comfortable saying to you that February is the appropriate point in which to talk about those things. Um, the it may be important enough simply to say that peatland restoration we know is very important mm -hmm. and indeed we've done the analysis to show how important that is. Um, we noted of course uh, the draft budget and the impact that has um, 
And I think it's important to say that I am very hopeful that peatland restoration will continue to be funded in, in the way that I'm sure this committee would like to see it funded. And it's, it, the, the budget is part of that planning. I'm sure there will be future iterations uh, of budgets. And in a way that's capable of delivering on a doubling of the target. Well, you have to wait to see the target, wouldn't you? So, uh, the, uh, but uh, um, I know it's your interest. <laughs> uh, it, it is a, a very strong interest in the sorry, I recognise the issues around budget, of course. And of course, some of the additional sums last year were drawn down from other sources. So there's, a, there's a, a legitimate issue here, but it's obviously a, a clearly important contributor to our performance around uh, these matters. I don't. I mean, I, 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 I'm desperate not to be slippery, so I, I do want to say <laughs> we'll that leave the, it there. Uh, the, yeah. um, the, the peatland restoration is very important, and it is remarkable actually how, how big the impact is in future years. So, I, I think. I mean, I. Uh, Far be it for me to try and direct the committee. I think one of the areas that this is one of the areas where co-benefits is really important. So actually developing for a number of reasons for a, pursuing a policy of peatland restoration, and we'll be making that argument, of course, internally as you would expect us to. Water in the quality, etc. Indeed, water yeah, quality, absolutely. and I think building an industry around those things is another one of those arguments. Yeah, there's certainly employment opportunities absolutely. around that. Okay, thank you for that. Let's explore behavioural change. At Richard Lyle, and I think Alex Rowley wants Greg, to come in um, as well. Good afternoon. Uh, behavioural change. Um, basically, the plan will only work if the public buy into it. And um, so, would you agree that changes in behaviour will need to contribute to the plan? In particular, would we propose, you may want to tell me yes or no in this one, uh, to have solar panels on new build as a, a, a policy to encourage people to do that? Electric car charging points on new build, you know, like you used to, you could put your plug, plug in your phone or plug in your Wi-Fi, now you can uh, plug in your car, or in fact uh, change the way that street furniture is, um, that we could have charging points on street furniture. So the whole gambit is behavioural change, what are we going to do to encourage the public to change? So can I introduce the committee to the concept of carrots and sticks and tambourines? Uh, and this is, tambourines. The way in, this is the way in which we've been considering things in the future. And um, well, I, I have, yes, a flourish, a rhetorical flourish. The, um, the, 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 our policy development in the past, certainly not under our watch, of course, has been littered with policies that haven't met the third element of that, and that is the feeling of being compelled to do something or wanting to do something. Um, and there's been a great deal of work, for example, done at the, you know, on the, on the, on the Green Deal, which you may think about as an example of a, a policy that hasn't worked as well as, the, as, as wasn't, were intended when that policy was used at UK level. And I believe passionately the reason that that doesn't work is because it was principally a financial in, implement, uh, instrument and, and it didn't have the tambourine element, which is incidentally is about the feeling of wishing to do something. Um, I, I am. I could not agree more with the way in which you summarised that. We we will not be successful unless there is a change in behaviour. I think it requires, though, a very deep consideration of the appropriate way in which we change that behaviour. So uh, the the concept of carrots and sticks and tambourines is one that we've been thinking. It's something we've been thinking particularly closely about when it comes to the energy efficiency programme I talked about, which is. I think at least a two-decade programme to see an overall improvement in what, effectively the quality of the building stock in Scotland. And we add in a load of other things to that programme too. But to be successful, we probably need a programme that for the first part of that 10 years looks more at incentives and the second half looks more at um, uh, the harder edge stuff. And it is the foresight that builds the industry, the foresight knowing that that will come. So you are right to raise those things. I think they will be enormously important. How we plan the built environment around us in particular is one of the areas where I think we will need um, uh, to be much clearer about the way in which we need to see things change and give suitable foresight that an industry can respond and the consumers can respond in their behaviour. I'm very keen on the idea of having a better um, regional or local plan around all of those things. And you'll see in the energy strategy that we published um, just before Christmas, um, written into the kind of DNA of that strategy is the idea that we, we will need better <coughs> localised planning around the whole energy system. And that is heat, power and transport or the built environment. 
and the idea that actually what we need is a well-integrated set of localised plans for those things that would, that would cover the issues that you've referred to in your question, like charging points, like solar panels on roofs, um, I could go on, like recovery of waste heat, those sorts of things. Um, I believe there is a sort of grand endeavour, endeavour actually, over the next two decades that will require everyone to understand better how, they're, how, they, you know, how they will fit into that plan. It will require us to have a different plan for the central belt from the highlands and the islands, for example. Um, and behind all of that is a harder edge set of things, including building standards and the regulatory tools and legislation that we will need to put in place to make that work. But we won't do it through those things alone. Um, we'll need some tambourines along the way too. In relation to um, electric charging points, and I think to a lesser extent solar panels, you'll have been encouraged by recent announcements by certain house builders that they're going to take this approach voluntarily. Yep. And I, that's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. So I, it, the, the, the promise even of a, of a harder edged approach to this is often enough to catalyse you know, change in the market. And, and, it, and, and that kind of time horizon, I mean, forget that we're talking about infrastructure here, so decades is the correct time horizon. Unless we are well planned now on that, then we, I don't think we, will, we can expect the industry to respond, nor can we expect consumers to respond the right way. Well, many years ago, people never thought of uh, having a telephone plug-in point in their house. No, it's standard. Absolutely. Wi-Fi, standard. Um, but the last question, if you allow me, convener. When was the last time we advertised on television to say, um, don't go in your car, have a wee walk down to the local shop? I, I don't know. I think it's a perfectly good question because it's, it, that we have we have a, a set of policies and marketing um, strategies that we pursue, including one that's under the banner of Greener Scotland. So um, I, I will forthwith go away and find out. Put it in the plan and put the tambourine in also. I agree. Let's have some tambourine. Thank you. Uh, Alec Rowley. I'm going to ask a couple of points there, but you, you talked about the built environment. So has there been clear discussion and is, will we be able to look at, for example, the draft planning bill that's making its way through Parliament just now and the climate change plan and be able to see clearly where, where these two fit? So I've learned uh, in my time in this job that <coughs> planning for very good reason doesn't move very quickly and it is quite right that it doesn't and indeed what's very important in making any change to planning is that there is a good strategy in the first place for the things that you're trying to achieve and I think we now have that on energy and climate issues and I, I hope now that the planning regime will, will, will follow that and it seems to me that's the right way to do it. But given the legislation that's going through now, will we be able to as a committee look at that and say yeah? There is clearly the opportunity there through the planning bill. I think you to will. To, so to be able to to be able to drive these kind of initiatives and developments, and and have you been working at that? Yes. So the planning bill is, of course, a really important um, uh, 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 important process for all of us, but it's especially important for us given the issues that I've just talked about. If I could draw your attention to a couple of things, really, the. Um, uh, one is a, a consultation that is in the second stage of consultation now around local heat and energy efficiency planning, and it is basically the blueprint for the thing that I've just described to you. So it's a very local authority-led approach to local plans around energy efficiency and heat. And it's not a great leap to think we might add into that transport planning, and then you've got almost you know, the full picture for a local plan for those things. So you'll be able to see that. And the other aspect, the other thing that I would draw your attention to is the future uh, revision to the national planning framework, um, which I hope will be cognizant of the, well, I know it will be cognizant of the climate change plan and, and indeed now the energy strategy, which again has the right long-term horizon to demonstrate how we can decarbonise our energy system and the round. In total, the NPF um, and the associated Scottish planning policy alongside those localised heat and energy efficiency plans with transport will allow you to look, I think, at the things that you would like to look at. So a, a well-integrated set of local and regional plans for these things in the future. And I think that's the right way to go about it. I look forward to seeing if that is the case. Can, can I also ask, you talked about the carrot and the stack. It's interesting that you have, like, McDonald's recently announced their, their plan. Is it 2030 mm -hmm. they're going to do X, Y, and Z? Uh, in 2030, most of their executives will have moved on and whatever. Is there not a danger that that we're, we're seeing company after company 
make these big announcements about what they're going to do a decade, a couple of decades ahead, when actually right now they're not doing very much? I, well, I definitely think that's a risk, yes. I, I, I see, though, pretty regularly corporate practice changing quite dramatically. I mean, you might, you know, there's, there's a pretty strong record of in recent years of um, uh, investment holdings from the likes of universities in Scotland, for example, and how those things can change quite dramatically, the outlook that we have. I uh, recognise the risk, and I suppose the right answer to your question is that it's one that I'm, rather than being passive about those things, I think we need to be active. So I think you do need a long-term set of plans which every corporate operating in the Scottish economy can feel that they, they want to follow. Um, it needs to be, though, developed with those corporates. Um, and a corporate is not a thing, really, so it's the individuals within it. So I, I think in setting the, the right set of long-term targets and objectives in each of those sectors, that gives us the platform then to discuss with those with the industries in those sectors how we can um, develop the right plans with them to see us, you know, I, I hope, overshoot the things that we've said that we will achieve. And that will be a mixture again of carrots and sticks. And the tambourine, I suppose, is that for those, car for those corporates to, to, to want to do this because it is in their commercial interest for them to do so, and I think that's an area where we haven't been perhaps as strong as we might, so it might have been in the past. So I, I would like to work harder at that, feeling that corporates operating in the Scottish economy do this because it is in their corporate interest to do so, not just because it's some sort of CSR measure, for example, but because it actually grows their business. So I mean, at the heart of all this is something I've said again to this committee, that why are we doing this at all? Um, we have a very small impact in global patterns of climate change. I believe the reason that we're doing it is principally an economic one, because if we turn around the Scottish economy to a decarbonised basis, then we will have products and services to sell to the global market as other countries in the world do the same. And I think we need to work very, very hard at establishing that principle, and it's not something you can just do and put in a document and hope that it sits there and, and have, has the attention of those corporates. You need to do it daily um, and weekly. So, you know, hold us to account on that. Okay, thank you. Um, final question from Mark Roscoe. So the climate bill will bring in new targets for 2020 and 2030. Um, how does this plan address those new targets? Is it sufficient enough to meet those new targets? Well, I think the, 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 the first answer, and it's not the only answer I give, is that we've put the plan together to meet the, to meet the current legislation. But clearly, I mean, it's the same people that I'm surrounded with that consider the issues. Um, so we've, we've had in mind all along the 90% trajectory. And there is a process to go through for the new bill. Um, and I think it's worth just thinking about the 90% target for a second. We've been through a process with the CCC to understand that. And then I'm paraphrasing here, but the CCC said 90% is in line with um, the objectives that were set in Paris. Um, but it's extremely challenging. They also said that the current plan, uh, if everything goes well, is just about sufficient. And we're therefore looking at that analysis. Um, I hope we do better than that. So uh, it may be that we need to revise plans. I think it will depend largely on the trajectory of climate missions in the future. But I do want to say that the bill process has been separate to the, to the formation of this plan. Um, we will have to bring those two things together um, later this year when the bill goes through Parliament. Um, and we wait to see, for example, the target, for, uh, the central target. I mean, these are, this is one of the kind of central issues. And I, I can't see, as I sit here before you, the extent to which we may need to amend or otherwise the, the current plan. So I think the First Minister um, said in Bonn that um, there was still consideration of a net zero carbon target, whether that would be set at yep. 2040, 2050. Uh, various countries are moving down that line, including Germany, Finland, Sweden. Is that, do, do you see a, a radically different approach if we were to set a net zero carbon target? Or I mean, again, it it's difficult. Is in traffic growth, for example, of 27%? Or are there more fundamental changes that would be required? I do, and I'll give you my personal view on that because you know, I don't think we, ha we have set out the analysis of that, but I do see a difference between net zero and 90, yes. And I do think that the plan um, will need to be on a pretty steep trajectory to get to, to get to net zero. Other countries have set it, 
People talk often about Sweden, for example, but they've done that with the knowledge that they might be, they buy international credits. I think what's been the hallmark of the Scottish plan is that this has been a domestic effort. So I, I, that's the thing I want to keep, uh, you know, when I think about So the are you saying you, you, you want to get rid of um, the provision of uh, carbon credits within Scottish legislation then? No. No, I'm not right, saying so that. I'm saying I'm, I'm keen to, to I'm keen to maintain that, that the the, okay. the 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 hallmark of the Scottish plan, which has okay. been a domestic effort, and not relying on some of those international mechanisms okay. wholly. So, okay, um, thank you. Thank the panel for the evidence that uh, you've given it. And can I take this opportunity to wish Chris Stark well in your new role at the UK CCC? Um, I think the committee would look forward to engaging with you in that capacity in future. I'm sure you'll be looking forward to offering advice to the Scottish Government on developing policies that you have um, brought forward? Well, they're a good bunch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, will, will you, just as a point of information, a, a colleague just asked that, will you still be in post here until the end of February? I will be, and then indeed my start date has not been arranged yet, but I, would, I, it's, I think it's good that we've had this on the record. I want to be very, I don't want there to be any implication that I'm uh, conflicted in that role. So we've, we will work that out. And I wanted, to, I wanted the committee to know that the, I mean, the appointment process hasn't formally completed yet actually, but I wanted the committee to know. So we'll be very careful about the way in which we manage the, the roles in the period that's coming. And I think just saying it's a very good uh, choice on the part of the UK CCC. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, at its next meeting on February the 6th, the committee will take oral evidence from stakeholders on the Scottish Association for Marine Science Research Services report review of the environmental impacts of salmon farming in Scotland. The committee also expects to consider its proposed approach to consideration of the Scottish Crown Estate Bill and a draft report on its air quality in Scotland inquiry. As agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is over. Thank you. <laughs>